Thank you very much. Thanks, Ashok and uh, Iraj on Ortho TV for providing this platform for the educational purposes. And thank you, Dr. Gadegone, for giving me opportunity to be a moderator for this webinar. Today, we are going to discuss intricacies of uh, femoral nailing. And this is episode three of the IOA Advanced Nailing Webinar. Uh, and uh, the theme aptly Dr. Gadegone has chosen today is intricacies of femoral nailing. He specifically wanted all difficult situations to be discussed. And we are here uh, to discuss all the intricacies. We'll be beginning this webinar uh, right now. And we propose to continue up to seven and sometime beyond. And I would ask Dr. Gadengone sir, to please address all the delegates. So good evening, all viewers of IOA, as well as the Arthur TV, and the viewers all over Maharashtra and all over India and world. Uh, this is the third webinar on intricacies of fixation of the femoral fractures. And this is only meant for how to avoid the pitfalls and complications of femoral nailing and how to execute a perfect way of doing the things in a femoral nailing in a difficult situation. So I thank Dr. Atul Srivastava, President of IOA, Vice President Anup Agrawal, President elect Ram Chadda, and Secretary Navin Bhai Thakkar, and also our academic chairman of IOA, Dr. Vivek Trika. He has given me a chance to formulate the four or five webinars regarding the advanced nailing, uh, nailing. So these are all very useful to the beginners as well as for senior orthopedic surgeons also. And we have chosen a very esteemed faculty from all over India. They, are, they have a very big name in their particular field. Uh, Dr. Ashok Gavaskar, Dr. Tanna Sir, Dr. Jawar Jetwaji, Dr. Vivek Trikaji, Dr. Shivi Shankar, and uh, Dr. Navin Thakkar, Dr. Chandak, myself, and so many others, those who are taking part in this discussion. So we'll have in here about 10 to 12 minutes presentation and at least two to three minute discussion so that in-depth knowledge of that particular subject is given to the audience. Thank you very much. And we'll begin with the first lecture of Dr. Ashok Gavaskar. And he is a well-known person. He doesn't need any introduction. And he will talk on atypical fractures of the femur. What is the genesis of this fracture? How to manage this? And how to avoid the complications? And why this fracture takes a longer time to unite uh, in a routine way? So thank you very much, uh, Ashok Gavaskar. You have accepted our invitation and please go ahead. <clears throat> thank you so much. Thank you so much. So I'll start sharing my screen. I, I hope you can see this. Yeah, we can see your screen. Just you'll have to make it full screen. Yeah, just give me a moment. Yeah. Okay. So no, thank you for the invitation, sir. Like uh, my talk would be on atypical fractures of the femur. It will be more of an overview, uh, highlighting the problems you see with treating these fractures surgically, predominantly with nails. And also we will uh, look at uh, what are the special challenges these fractures pose in terms of understanding them, treating them sufficiently, and then getting the best results out of whatever you do. So the learning objects, objectives for this talk would be to define the peculiar or unique characteristics that distinguish an atypical femoral fracture from other fractures that occur after a traumatic event in a normal femur. We'll try to identify problem areas that we consider are important in treating atypical femoral fractures. I'll also discuss some of the technical considerations that we have to consider when we treat these fractures surgically. And finally, I'll also describe some of our own and published techniques and adaptations that you might have to adopt to successfully treat these fractures by intramedullary nagging. So what exactly are atypical femoral fractures? These fractures are low energy injuries, a form of a stress or an insufficiency fracture, 
these patients are often on long term bisphosphonate therapy but not necessarily always any drug that reduces bone turnover over a period of time can cause such fractures and we have seen fractures after dinosumab therapy after ibandronate another bisphosphonate and even after long term usage of proton pump inhibitors and glucocorticoids you can also get similar fractures in diseases that produce a similar condition like hypophosphatasia osteopetrosis and other metabolic bone diseases and even rheumatoid arthritis so any pathology that kind of creates a low bone turnover state can cause this kind of stress or insufficiency fractures so if you look at the pathology or pathogenesis behind these fractures what these drugs typically do is they create a low bone turnover state which causes uncoupling of bone deposition and resorption so over a period of time there is abnormal remodeling of the femoral bone which kinds of creates ice tensile areas on the lateral side so these fractures predominantly occur in the subtrochanteric region but not necessarily always they can occur actually anywhere on the femur and if you look at the ev- evolution of the femoral remodeling more older patients tend to have more remodeling and in these patients more the remodeling of the femur is the fracture tends to occur more distally and when they occur more and more distally it's actually much more difficult to treat and in these patients there is also abnormalities seen in bone mineralization so that is why you see thick and cortices on the lateral side this creates stiffer bone which are also more brittle and if you look at the pathology of these fractures they often start laterally and then propagate and that is why patients most of the time have prodromal type pain and most often than not these fractures are atraumatic and or mm-hmm. might be preceded by a trivial trauma so as i said these fractures can occur anywhere on the femur more commonly in the subtrochanteric region and there is bilaterality in up to 20 percentage so a lot of these fractures can be bilateral and it is important to screen the other side as well and these fractures have typical radiological characteristics if you look at the american society for bone mineral research classification they have like kind of like not classification they have kind of laid down major and minor criteria to identify and diagnose these fractures so these femurs are kind of like trump shaped proximally they have bowing in both planes and you get laterally thick and bone and these fractures tend to be low velocity ones so you have transverse or short oblique patterns and these fractures typically have a characteristic medial spike so these are signs that you can look for in an ap and lateral x rays to identify whether they are atypical fractures so what makes atypical fractures difficult to treat as i said the first thing is the abnormal anatomy so you don't have a normal looking femur and you have excessive bowing in both planes apart from thick and cortices and sometimes you can even have completely obliterated canals so this makes it difficult to choose your implant and it is difficult for any implant to be put in satisfactorily and there are situations where you cannot just nail these fractures so you have to be very choose very very critical of your implant selection and your technique you cannot like nail these fractures as you would do in a routine femur and you need to adopt certain uh, specificities or techniques to nail them successfully so that you don't end up in issues these fractures also have a very high rate of complications for a lot of reasons that i mentioned already so if you look at this paper from the north america they have reported a complication rate of up to 68 percentage and you can have complications like intraoperative fractures because of the abnormal anatomy trying to shovel in a straight nail into a curved femur can cause a lot of problems you can have cortical perforations distally you can have malalignments especially with proximal fractures not and even in diaphyseal fractures as well and these fractures can be complicated by delayed healing if you look at the average time for these fractures to heal this is much more than what a normal fracture in a normal femur will took so these fractures heal at around a mean of 8.5 months and 
delayed or non union in well done surgeries are still common up to a rate of up to 20 percentage so when you have these fractures bilaterally or if you have a fracture that is incomplete where a present a patient present to you with prodromal thigh pain the question is should we treat them by surgically or should you wait and watch the answer is yes most of the times if you have a complete fracture then if you have a suspicious looking impending fracture on the lateral or opposite side it is better treated surgically but if you have a patient that is that is still not fractured yet but if you are thinking of treating him surgically or non surgically then you can kind of look at some of the uh, characteristics of the uh, problem like if you have a fracture line that extends for more than 50 percentage from the lateral cortex if patients have significant thigh pain then they should be treated surgically or else the other ones can be kept on a watch wait and watch protocol making sure you don't allow them complete weight bearing you allow them on protected weight bearing and then you can allow them to go back to weight bearing once the bone edema everything settles down so why should we do prophylactic nailing in these fractures before they fracture because one it is easier much much more easier than to do uh, nailing in a atypical fracture that is complete and displaced and these fractures heal much better as well before they become complete and if you look at this study where they treated 12 fractures and in once they treated six fractures before the fracture completely occurred that is like it became complete and they achieved 100% healing after prophylactic nailing and the fractures that they treated or kind of like observed over a period of time 100% of them became complete fractures and when it was treated by surgical means 85 percentage did not heal at a mean of 18 months so this kind of like tells you uh, how difficult it is to achieve healing in atypical fractures so what does the abdominal anatomy mean technically in terms of how we kind of internally fix these fractures so as i said you have significant bowing in two planes which kinds of makes us makes it difficult to nail you have thickened cortices on the lateral side which can kind of deflect your nail more and more medially creating a varus malalignment you can even have obliterated canals and if you do not identify them and have the necessary tools in hand you might be kind of like struggling to get your guide wire or reamer across the sclerotic fracture site this fra- this bone the thickened cortices are stiff but they are brittle as you can see on the x-ray image on the right side they are brittle and if you are not careful you will just break them and when you try to put in a nail either straight or the ones with the angle there is always a mismatch between the nail and the osseous anatomy and more often than not you are not bound to kind of get an anatomical reduction in these fractures however hard you try so the other question is like can we nail can we plate them probably not a bad not a great option just like these fractures these bones have i varus movement because of the bowing and if you're going to position your plates on the lateral side they have an i propensity to fail and these fractures also take a long time to heal and if you're going to plate them you may have to kind of like keep them non weight bearing or protected weight bearing for a long time which may not be ideal as well so what do we use nail or plates so if you look at uh, this two illustrative examples there is an i rate of implant failure after plates and there is an i incidence of revision surgery as well compared to use of im nails which uh, which kind of like achieve sufficient healing at a much longer period at around 12 months time so definitely intramedullary nails even though they are challenging or the preferred mode of fixation in the fractures for a lot of reasons it pro- avoids prolonged immobility or restricted weight bearing one thing you need to kind of like make, keep in mind is that if you are going to create mal alignment which is can be which can be very quite common it can be a big risk factor for the delayed healing of the fractures so if you but as i said like since we are going to nail most of these fractures because of whatever advantage i told you we have to consider what are the technical challenges so if you look at fractures subtrochanterically uh, location 
we tend to kind of nail these fractures and, 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 and I think that's a recommendation as well in lateral position because it gives you access to the entry point easily. We use a retrograde entry portal through the fracture site so that we can get a medialized start point and also get an entry point slightly anterior to the midline so that you can get your cephalomedullary screws and also avoid cortical perforations distally. And if you have thick and lateral cortices, which is most often the case, you need to selectively ream the cortex. You can use blocking screws medially to direct your reamer laterally. And what we usually do is like we open it and then kind of like burr out or ream out the lateral cortex. So, this is one of our paper where we kind of like highlighted the utility of going retrograde. So these fractures can be you kind of like addressed in this manner. Get your entry point retrograde. It's very easy. You don't have to struggle. So you get a medialized start point. You can also project your reamer from distal to proximal so that you can selectively core out that thick and lateral cortex very easily. You don't have to struggle. So this is our preferred uh, way of doing it in these fractures and also for some of the revision subtracts. So this is one illustrative example in a patient, which is around like uh, 60 odd, uh, female on long-term bisphosphonate therapy. You can see, you can see the typical uh, nature of the fracture on the top left image. And again, as I said, we go retrograde. You can see the 4mm drill bit going up from distal to proximal. And then we ream out the lateral cortex. And once we have got a reduction, weld them together and then ream out the uh, rest of the medullary canal. And you can see in image 5D, this is from the journal that we published. So you can see that once the nail goes in, we still create a slight varus malalignment. So again, the nail comes out, even though our entry point is good. So we have a couple of block wires medially to get the nail more laterally. And then finally, I could have used the blocking screw, but in this case, I use a small lateral plate used with a tension device. And then that is the kind of final construct and it went on to heal well. So these are some of the things that you need to adopt if you want to get a good reduction and allow these fractures to heal. And if you look at the image on the right, the AP image, you can see the thin down lateral cortex in the proximal segment compared to what you can see preoperatively. So this is another patient, like uh, she's probably in the 50s, again, an atypical femoral fracture. You can see the cortex is like, it's, it, the canal is completely obliterated. If you can look at the second image, there is no medullary canal here. So you have to like, kind of open it then establish our uh, medullary canal, and then finally adopt whatever techniques that I told you before in the slide. And this fracture went on to heal without any problems as well. You can use other techniques for uh, endosteal decreaming as well from proximal, but this is our preferred way of doing it. So what about diaphyseal fractures? Again, these fractures are best nailed in the lateral position, but the entry we use compared to subtract fractures is a much more lateral entry in the coronal plane. And we use a straight start, straight nail that, that is a pyriformis entry nail. And the sagittal plane entry remains the same, slightly anterior to midline. So what this does is like, if you can see the right side image, if you have a straight nail going through a pyriformis entry, you create a kind of a straight bone causing a opening up of the medial cortex. And you can also have perforations laterally or impingements. But if you use a straight nail from a lateralized entry point, you kind of like your nail hugs the medial cortex, doesn't create a mal 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 malalignment, and your fracture can get a great reduction. Similarly, on the sagittal plane, if your entry is more anterior, then your nail hugs the posterior cortex, or else you are at risk for anterior perforation. So it's preferable that you use small diameter nails making sure you don't uh, kind of like use a very small diameter nail, use something that is somewhere around nine, 10, probably a 10 most of the times, don't have to be more than that. If possible, use a small with a very small radius of curvature. And most of our nails that we have in India have a radius of curvature more than one. So you can bend your nail as well, but you have to do it carefully. I haven't done it yet, but there are reports that you can do it. So this is another patient, a 66 year old female and dysphosphonate therapy for six years. Uh, kind of a, a more extensive remodeling and diaphyseal fracture. And if you look at that, like we adopted whatever I told you the previous slide, but we still kind of straightened the bone. You can see good cortical contact um, in the middle, in the, on the lateral side, not so on the medial side, the bone becomes straight. And we used a slightly more lateralized entry point and a more anterior entry point. If you can look at the last right image, 
uh, but she went on to yield pretty well at around 13 months. You can see the last image, you can see the nail hugging the posterior cortex. And in the AP image, the nail is in the center, but we still created a small malalignment. So this still went on to yield without a problem. But like uh, we might do it a little bit differently if I do it now, maybe a more lateral entry point. So what else can you do to facilitate healing of these fractures? So what is the role of stopping these phosphonates? So that is the first thing we all do, but do they, does it have an effect? Probably not because these drugs have a long, long off-life. So even if you stop, they may not have a major effect in terms of reducing your healing periods, but uh, that is something that you can consider. Recombinant uh, parathormone have been shown to have a positive effect in healing of these fractures, and that is something that we use for all our atypical fractures after nailing. So another question is like, uh, since bisphosphonates have been very commonly associated with this fracture, should we stop using them and look for better alternatives? Probably no, because these, fractures, these drugs are effective in preventing osteoporotic fractures by a magnitude of 30%. So it would mean for every 100 osteoporotic fractures that are prevented, you get one bisphosphonate to induce atypical fracture. That is not a bad deal. So these drugs are relatively safe provided you don't use them for more than three to five years. These drugs have a really, really long half-life, so you don't even need to use beyond that. And if you look at the papers where there are higher incidence of delayed union, these are in patients where the drug was used more than three years. And avoid using proton pump inhibitors and steroids along with these drugs because they have an additive negative effect. So in summary, atypical femoral fractures represent a surgical treatment challenge. Intramillary nailing is the preferred treatment over plates because of the biomechanical advantages and to also deal with prolonged healing and in order to allow early weight bearing. Several technical considerations that I highlighted has to be factored in to allow conventional nailing systems to be used in highly variable anatomies. And augmentation with teriparatide has been shown to reduce healing times after these fractures. Thank you. Thank you, Ashok. That was wonderful. Uh, presentation on atypical fractures of femur. Any questions from the panelists? Any any opinions? Yeah, Jetwa sir, please. Uh, we have tried old nail to band. What he is speaking about giving a band to the nail, but it does not congruently band. You know, the, the we have tried like with my shaping press, which is very sturdy. But sometimes we have very high bow of the femur where none of the nail will accommodate so well. But yes, it is a difficulty. I think we could have a very big sort of an instrument to band such nail. Yes, sir, I, I agree. Like, uh, and also the, uh, uh, the point of bending, the accuracy of bending, you need to protect those locking yes. holes as well. Yeah. And uh, the, the, there are studies like where they have done uh, uh, studies using 3D CTs like to understand where they exactly bent and even people use it to have 3D models to kind of do this. This problem happens predominantly in fractures that happen distal. The subtracts are not a problem in this ones actually because the subtract fractures yeah, they represent uh, a minimal amount of bone remodeling actually because like that's in the earlier phase but in uh, the, the ones that you see distally are often tends to be older patients as well and they have a more extensive amount of remodeling so these are the ones that can get you into trouble yes and uh, i i haven't i haven't bent a nail personally but like there are reports so probably uh, when i get a chance to do it might try so upper, upper fractures you are right that uh, you know we can use a short pf and or short and we get away. It is a problem with the lower half where you have to have this curvature. If there is a fracture in the upper half, hmm. the, the femur is really not bored. If the fracture is in the lower half yeah. or in the mid shaft, then only it is bored. So hmm. in the upper subtrochantic fractures, a normal straight nail, I don't think is going to be the issue, except as he rightly mentioned, the medullary cavity is blocked so very often into the alendronic fractures. And that's the reason why you may have to go through the fracture site to do the reading. Ashok, if I can ask you. Yes, sir. Mid-shaft fractures at times, they are missed quite a lot. And uh, the patient is complaining of pain. We, are, we get the x-rays of the hip, and even if we get the x-rays of the femur, it doesn't show that lateral thickening which we see subprochantric. On a, quite a few occasions, I have been able to pick it up onto the PET scans. Particularly, I think yes, if there is a pain which is there 
which is unexplained into elderly person. Yes, then a PET scan is the one which will pick it up. So if you pick it up before the fracture occurs, as you rightly mentioned, the whole, the whole treatment is simple. But if you pick it up after the fracture, then the whole problem starts. Yes, sir. Like uh, we, we have done an MRI. Okay, like MRI does exactly. show uh, bone edema on the lateral cortex. And uh, PET will give you a more hyperactivity there. So I think... Uh, PET will also show you a small crack which is not seen into the X-rays. Because it's the PET CT which we're talking about. And I have quite a few cases where this is beautifully demonstrated in PET CT, which was in MRI. The MRI specialist couldn't interpret it much. He says there is something there alone. But then he wanted some corroboration. Okay. Gade Kone, sir, have you ever bent a, a round nail or an interlocking nail? No, no, it is impossible to do that. I have not done it and it, I don't think it is possible to do a on table. If you want to do it already, then you have to do it before operation. On table, it is difficult for me. And we were able to bend the previous K nails. K nails. K nails, they are elastic nails because of lower lip uh, uh, that uh, configuration and they were it is supposed to be elastic. And therefore, it was possible to bend. Ashok, may I ask you one question? Yeah, please go ahead, sir. Uh, um, when you do a open reduction and already there is a cortical uh, bone is a little bit uh, vascular, do you do some uh, decortication of the outer cortex in a bispasponate fracture or a typical fracture? I think he just got uh, logged out. He's connecting again. Uh, and, then, and, and he has spoken mainly about the fresh fractures. And we see so many of them with the non-unions and operated upon and everything. Any thoughts on to that? Because I feel that is the biggest challenge ever anybody can have is the alendoret fracture which is operated upon which is not your right. Sir, uh, sorry, I missed the question because my uh, kind of connection went off. You are talking about like the unnamed fractures like... Uh, no, you can't hear you. So, what Dr. Tanna was asking was, uh, fresh fracture, it's fine. What about the non-union after a, a typical fracture? Yeah, we, 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 have, we have treated a couple of non-union. Uh, Ashok, we can't hear you. Can you, can you speak to the mic or... Uh, yeah. Your voice was not clear. Okay. Rika, sir, you wanted to comment? I, I think you are going to comment. By no, I was, just, I was just going to ask him one more question regarding the bowing part, especially in the distal part or when the distal or the middle shaft of the femur is involved. And... We try to put in a nail, whichever nail, you are not able to get the accurate apposition of both the ends. And invariably, there is going to be opening at the medial side, which might be wide, depending upon the radius of curvature of the nail. And especially in the distal junctional type of fractures, which are in the distal third of femur, what is the protocol worldwide and in his experience regarding leaving that gap? putting in some bone graft or what? Because you see that your bones are wide like this and opening up is there. So how do we just leave it like that, especially when we know that it is going to take a long time to unite or can we do something else as well for that? Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Yeah, so like uh, uh, we, have, we have not grafted any fractures so far. Like there have been instances there are where there are medial gaps, a few of them, as the one that I showed. We have not mm -hmm. grafted anything so far, but I'm not sure like how much you can leave. So we try to kind of like get the alignment as much as possible. And uh, there, there have been instances I have used a blocking screw laterally to get the nail more medially so that to minimize the gap on the medial side. But uh, there have been non, not instances where I have uh, kind of like grafted one acutely. Uh, so I, I don't know how much you can leave, but I understand there are a lot of times the nail, the, the bone becomes straightened. 
and yeah. uh, the bone becomes straightened and sometimes if in, in extreme case if you try too hard you can break it break it so yeah so i think like there is a balance that you need to achieve and uh, probably in those situations uh, bending a nail might be the better option if you are still insist on using a nail if there are kind of like you are straightening the bone a lot and you are leaving a big gap on the medial side but uh, uh, that is uh, that is the only thing i can think of but i haven't bent a nail so far but there are reports where people have used it and there are also reports of using the opposite side nail i am not sure how that really works vivek yes vivek if i can ask you mm-hmm. the bone graft which you talked about for this silent no net fracture I, i i know what you're talking about sir but what else do we have because many a times in a prophylactic nailing if we are doing for a bisphosphonate induced atypical fracture you invariably tend to break the bone to get your nail in many a times it can happen that you have to break because the bow of the femur is such that you know that it is an impending atypical fracture and the bow nail is not going to get in and when you do it the medial side will open up in close reaming it is okay but many a times as a non union or an open reaming what to do that's the question i'll i'll tell you what i do so in that situation because this is as you very rightly said in a mid shaft or a lower down it is very quite often you see that in that situation i think you are not sure whether this is going to help i put an edge one plate there and i put a bmp graft because i feel photograph is not as good enough so i think the bmp though it is expensive so obviously we are talking about the expensive treatment for that okay. sangeet you wanted to come in yeah in in those situation where we have created a open wedge <clears throat> uh, you can put a undersized nail and add a augment plate augment to give a because they take a longer time to heal as compared to a normal fracture and a situation where non union probably uh, rather than correcting completely you under correct it use a thinner size nail and augment with a small plate okay so okay. thank so, you ashok for your uh, excellent presentation on a very uh, difficult uh, typical fractures now we move on to a next lecture by dr sangeet gawale on uh, uh, left out uh, butterfly fragment displaced fragment after nailing because dr shiv shankar is uh, driving therefore uh, you have to start uh, sangeet am i seen and audible yes both so uh, that is my talk uh, flipped what do we do with the flip rotated displaced butterfly fragment which we often see after nailing femoral fractures like this where uh, here that fragment is rotated by almost 180 degrees uh comminution is a part of these fractures and they uh, they that is seen in about 5% of femoral shaft fractures most often as a part of segmental fracture uh, of the femur and the usually they are the result of a high energy injuries and usually accompanied by massive soft tissue disruptions of the femur and the uh, fem- and the muscles so you can have either a large fragment or a segment which is split into multiple fragments very often when you nail them and uh, achieve a appropriate length give a stable construct uh, most of these fragments they will align and they do not need any separate treatment uh, apart from doing a close nailing uh, most will align with close nailing and they do not need any separate this is a half butterfly you can see uh, that fragment which is involving the distal uh, femur it is uh, reversed and nothing was done but it is very close to the nail and that is how it has healed here the construct is good with the nail length thickness and adequate number of screws in proximal and distal uh, canal comminution in the presence of a poor construct here you can see that size of the nail is very thin the butterfly has aligned it is separated it is not flipped but the same treatment uh, look at the butterfly how it behaves 
and that is how even after doing a exchange close nailing that butterfly failed to heal and end result is a non union it and uh, a breakage of the distal screws position is lost there is shortening and that is how that butterfly or the non or a non union behaves when uh, the implant construct is poor now these butterfly in complex fracture uh, leave a larger fracture gap more bending stresses and more instability so usually when we have comminution you require a stronger construct and for simplicity i'll divide into subtrochantric diaphyseal and diaphyseal supracondylar segments the subtrochantric diaphyseal component are the fractures which are like this uh, often there is a lateral comminution then we can have a pure diaphyseal intercalary segment or we can have a diaphyseal supracondylar segment most often on a fracture table you can reestablish the proper length rotation and alignment by uh, checking the opposite knee or the medial malleolus or uh, using uh, imaging for the opposite femur a full length radiograph of the contralateral femur is beneficial when we are equalizing the limb length in the presence of comminution the reduction tools which are helpful mallets or a spike pusher they are useful to push the fragment closer to the nail however a flip fragment uh, cannot be reversed even if you try to manipulate with the k wire in a close way so very often if you want to rotate you have to do a formal open reduction various hooks can be useful to some extent in realigning this comminuted fragments unicortical diaphyseal or bicortical metaphyseal in those situation you can use a shan spin but i doubt whether they are really helpful in rotating the fragment in a close method double butterfly where you see a segment which is split into two has here a large reverse fragment and once you nail it there will be a large bone gap and that will have tremendous strain on the bare part of the nail and that will have a worse outcome and uh, in those situation the union rate normally uh, of a femur is about in a diaphyseal area is about 98% so here in the presence of comminution where the fragments have displaced they are away from the nail reduces by about 6 to 8% uh, in this situation where even after alignment even after uh, uh, maintaining the axis having locked proximal and distal fragment you have a situation where uh, it is reversed the about 2 inches of the nail is bare there is no bone around we we are in a dilemma whether to bone graft whether to do a encerclage or uh, do a percutaneous methods or wiring so even if you try to rotate it doesn't budge and once you have achieved a stable reduction the reverse uh, morphology here the endosteum is turned on the opposite side by almost 180 degrees so what do we expect uh, the close reaming products on the medial side you can see at 2 months they have thrown some new bone and at 5 months and then at 8 months that fragment has completely incorporated so that is usually the fate of a butter reverse fragment when you have uh, a younger individual where you have achieved a good construct stability so these butterfly fragment they need need not be uh, opened they need not be rotated they need not be wired provided they are very close to the nail so that is the healing at about 7 to 9 months this is the 9 months actually now uh, another situation particularly when you have in the diaphysis you have a situation uh, larger the size after nailing you can see the there is a rotated butterfly fragment but one end is still in contact with the distal fragment the other one is separated only by about half a centimeter and that fragment is still very close to the nail so well aligned long thick static nail will Uh, give a good construct stability no graft was done and you can see at about 3 months 
there is a newborn formation at both the ends of this rotated fragment and subsequently at about eight months or nine months that you can see a healing of both the ends of this butterfly to the proximal and distal fragment and on the opposite side there is a good callus and air corporation of the another butterfly which was on the postromedial side. <clears throat> we construct Uh, when the nail size is thin, uh, there is a large butterfly which is separated by almost a centimeter here. So this fragment, this butterfly fragment is separated by more than a centimeter from the nail. So the strain on the nail, the stresses, the bending stresses at the non at the fracture site are tremendous in the uh, situation where that fragment has separated significantly and is away from the nail. So there is a continuous fragment motion which does not allow the callus to form. There is a poor contact at both the ends, the proximal and distal end, and that leads to breakage of the distal screws first, and then subsequently the nail is going to break. So when you have a situation like this, the uh, more than a centimeter separation of that butterfly fragment, the incidence of non-union or breakage of implant increases to almost 21%. So this was uh, exchange nail and grafting. The fragment was left alone like that. And that is uh, at about six months and that completely healed in a year's time. That is his range of movement. Uh, additional circlage, when do we use it? Very rarely, particularly when you have a very large fragment, more than eight centimeter, uh, there is also a study which suggests if the fragment is lar larger, the chances of uh, non-union are very high. And you must address this by a circlage wire or a cortical screw by opening and reversing or realigning the fragment uh, to the nail. Here, the reduction was difficult and hence, we had to open reduce it and that was the reason that butterfly we have used a circlage wire however the results have been almost the same it also healed in an expected time that is his function uh, when you are at the junctional zone the nail usually following a non-union it tends to translate medially leading a fracture malalignment non-union with a broken nail in a junctional zone here that butterfly fragment has healed at one end. However, it is there is a non-union at the distal side and that uh, butterfly fragment is not contributing to the healing or newborn formation. Again, here, the mechanics are poor. The distal fragment is small and the construct stability is poor because of the wide medullary canal. So here, it needs a dual implant where uh, don't try to manipulate that butterfly fragment, uh, supracondylar nail after removing the previous implant, adding a derotation plate, which uh, a small plate where you can put 3.5 screws anterior and posterior to the nail, uh, will give you a good bicortical hold and just three or four screws across are adequate to give a stability in this situation where at about a year, uh, year, and about uh, nine months, almost two years here, you can see that is a good healing of the non-union and that is the patient's function. When we have a situation where that fragment is split into two, uh, usually that the one fragment tends to heal or take a longer time. Here, it took almost two years to heal, but in uh, before that, this has to be exchanged as uh, that fragment was not contributing and there was a delayed response. Hence, a grafting and an exchange nail was done here. The construct was changed and that healed in an expected time. Uh, even in a segmental fracture, we may have a combination, we may have a butterfly, but uh, if you do a close nailing and realign them, most of them will fall back in position and they do not need any separate treatment. We have situations where 
the fragment has rotated significantly. So in the presence, uh, even if you do a bone graft, uh, you can see that fragment is totally separated from proximal and distal fragment. Here, even if you do a bone graft, that graft in the presence of instability, the nail is uh, loose in the distal canal, that graft will be resolved and we have to change to a different uh, composition of the construct, wherein you have to use a bridge plate and that solved the problem of healing. Uh, the advantage of plating is direct visualization to assist the fragment reduction and achieve a primary stability with the help of a plate, interfrag screws, like that. The disadvantage is it is associated with periosteal stripping, increased blood loss, and increased operating room time. To conclude, after nailing, most of these fragments will realign and they do not need any separate fixation. Provided the length, rotation, and axis axial alignment is addressed, uh, these fragments should be left alone. Aim of a stable construct should be a thicker nail and more number of screws in proximal and distal fragment. If unstable, you can use if there is a significant instability or you are not able to pass a thicker nail or the configuration of the fracture is such where you cannot use number of screws proximally and distally. Then in those situations, you can use an augment uh, plate or you can augment the fixation with a screw or a circlage wire. Even rotated fragment will heal fractures extending in the junction where stability in the shorter fragment is doubtful, always augment this junctional fracture with a uh, additional plate. More than a centimeter uh, separation of the reverse fragment uh, from the nail, uh, the one has to, it has a poor prognosis and these are the ones which you have to ob observe uh, serially when you, they come for follow-up. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sangeet. Any questions? Uh, to I, I have a question that, uh, Sangeet, could you find out that depending on the location of that reverse fragment, whether it is anteromedial or posteromedial or anterolateral or posterolateral, the things have some common observation or it is irrespective of the position of the fragment? Uh, sir, uh, the femur is surrounded by muscles. So uh, it is not specific that you will have a type of butterfly fragment uh, which will reverse or which will rotate by say 90 degrees or 180 degrees if it is anteriorly, anteromedially or posteriorly. But usually these, uh, uh, you have to follow the muscle attachment. And uh, why did you ask the question, sir? Is there any significance as far uh, as- My question is that, you know, we know that yes, Femur is completely surrounded by good muscular vascularity. But as we know in tibia, we think of on the posterior side, it is a good site where there is a good vascularity. Meanwhile, in femur, have you observed that on this side of fragment, they take longer time to heal rather than on this side of, so, like, you know, on the adductor region where there is a good muscles. Or sometimes on the lateral side, we have. We have vastus lateralis, but sometimes in postural lateral side, we have a little less. So have you observed anything or is there any, any, any thought? There are two observations. One is uh, the size of the fragment, uh, four, four, uh, uh, eight millimeters or equal to or more than that. They have uh, higher eight centimeters, sorry. So eight more than eight centimeter fragment. They have a higher chances of a delayed healing. Second, if the contact of the butterfly is not there at one of the ends or it is separated beyond a centimeter, these are the ones which are likely to head for a non-union. But again, and third factor is the age. And fourth is how well-fitting your nail is in the medullary canal. That means working length. Sangeet, I have a question. Uh, how, how do you kind of like uh, assess your length when you have these fractures? Because if you look at some of them, like, uh, yeah, your butterfly kind of like uh, crosses your fracture ends. 
So some of those might be a little short. So like uh, I used to, we used to do it closed as well before, but like uh, nowadays, like whenever I have a segmental combination, if you did butterflies or when there is no cortical contact at all, I kind of like tend to open and just go back to the butterfly, keep it there, don't wire or something, just as a measure of getting my length right and then nail them. So any observations on that? Um, I Most of them I do on a fracture table. So what I do is I ensure and check both the lesser trochanter and I try to get them in one view. And the second is uh, the distal, that means the knee joint. So uh, in one shoot, or even if you adjust the height of the C-arm, you cannot see the complete both the knees. So even if you see part of the medial joint line, then probably you get an idea whether uh, you are shortening or you are at the level or you have lengthened. That is the only okay. thing. So your, your rotation as well, because I, I've said like, yeah. if you can get that butterfly locked in, that I know that my rotation is right, my length is right. So, so I don't have to kind of struggle. So that is one reason why uh, in recent times, like maybe a, a last couple of years, like we go after this, open, don't dissect too much, but like get some uh, uh, small clamps and then get my butterfly reduced, the bigger one, and then nail them. Yeah, that is the problem. Even if you check the lesser trochanter and the sup, uh, patella, uh, overlap of the patella in the notch, still uh, there may be an error of uh, mal rotation at the end. Yeah. So, uh, with that, I think we move on to the next. I comment, doctor. Yeah, please, sir. Please, sir. Uh, I think uh, there is a very scanty literature available on these butterfly fragments, but uh, the recommendation are, uh, I agree with um, Gawale that uh, more than one centimeter of the gap, more than 2.5 then uh, it is better to do uh, as Gavaskar is saying that you do open reduction. In recent times, I'm doing more open reduction than I used to do because if you see the failure pattern the, um, uh, the patients who have the gap uh, and uh, this, uh, the nail breaks and you have more failure pattern. Rather than uh, uh, the nail which has been such like wire or the fragment has uh, put in back because the union is faster. He has shown the cases the union was for two, two years. It took two years. In two years, a lot of implant uh, fail, I'm afraid. Any, any comments from the Tanna, sir? So, sir, your philosophies? I think we can move on to next lecture. Um, Gadi Gone, sir, you have already shared the screen. Please go ahead. So, uh, thank you, Chandak, sir, for giving me a very difficult topic. That is uh, uh, perinail, perinail, especially perinail femoral uh, fractures. So, good evening, everybody. So, with the increased use of retrograde and integrate nails, uh, this uh, treatment for long bone fracture, there is increased use and that is the most important treatment nowadays for diaphyseal and proximal and distal femoral fractures. So a fracture proximal or distal to long or short nails are not rare. However, lack of literature on this subject, no treatment guideline and few cases had been reported in literature. So definition of a peri-implant femoral fracture is a conceptually defined as a femoral fracture in the presence of a pre-existing non-prosthetic implant. Therefore, a peri-implant femoral fracture and a periprosthetic fracture are completely different entities which should be assessed separately. Exact incident is not known the incidence reported in recent literature is 1.7 to 2.6 percent. Secondary fracture around a femoral nail is one of the most significant healing complications. The challenging factor is original implant, whether to retain or remove when you get a peri-implant fracture. And then another challenging factor is the associated osteoporosis, screw holes, 
weakness area bridging or overlap implant position of a peri implant fracture and healing status of a original fracture so broadly divided into two fracture pattern the fracture at the tip of the implant or nail you can say because we are basically now discussing only the peri nail fracture peri nail fracture and distal to the implant where the fracture has healed or not that we will see so that chan has classified the fracture type 1 at the tip and type 2 at the distal end and he has also mentioned a b c whether the fracture is healed not healed or healing similar type of a classification is also described by virgilius classification system and that is the same as you get the chance classification with little modification whether the pattern of the fracture is included so the two italian association of orthopedic surgeon not only the proximal or distal to the tip but you must also assess the classification proposal and the factor to be considered in classification fracture localization fracture morphology fracture fragmentation and healing status of the previous fracture so this is one of the first example a unstable fracture neck tumor note a tight proximal canal in a dark female and you can see this is the treated by pfa nail and you on the closer observation you will find that the fracture localization around the nail near the keypal is true there is a secondary fracture uh, uh, during the nailing has occurred so 16.5 mm pfa nail being wedged into the narrow femoral canal to get next step screw into the center of the femoral head leading to the hydrogenic fracture of the anterior part of the proximal femur so when message when the nail is not progressing with each blow of hammer consider nail or canal mismatch a cephalic medullary nail have expanded proximal part 16.5 to 17 mm reamer to be used its full extent especially if the proximal canal is tight tight before you put the nail so subsequent follow up this is the fragment butterfly fragment and the fracture healed without any problem another example a fracture shaft of the femur at the junctional zone with patella fracture in a 32 year old male treated by close interlock nail ultimately after a Three months of surgery while driving to its scooter, he had a fracture propagation, localization of fracture around the nail of the distal screw, and you can see here it's a comminuted fracture extending into the supracondylar area. In a such a situation, then locking plate is applied after removal of the lower bolts, and bone grafting was done. Six month follow up, the fracture is. Hey, the such type of a perinealer fracture through the screw holes with the excessive uh, trauma or stress at the fracture site before healing, you may get a fracture. Another example: a 80-year female with a A2 type of a fracture suitable to be treated by PFN, and you can see it's a a very thin lateral wall and a dwarf lady, and you can see here X-ray after two weeks revealed a complete spiral fracture. fracture localization around the distal screws and near the tip of the nail because of the mismatch of the canal and probably weakening of the shaft through in the screw holes so probably probable cause is stress riser during internal fixation nail curvature mismatch any drill hole up to 20% of the bone's diameter will weaken bone by 40 90 of the fracture around fixation implant occur through 90% of the fracture they occurs around the drill holes and this is already published in 1994 so treatment options in this case this is how it is there is a stress fracture through the screw holes may be a mismatch and it's a uh, such a fragmented fracture patient was reoperated with the removal of the implant and reersion of the long pfn and the patient has unevenful healing another example 
a fracture after a short nail, you will find these are the majority seen on the red subgroup. We will get a stress fracture at the tip of the nail. Whatever the implant you use, whether you use a two screw system, single screw system, or even a, a anatomical nail. A press fit implant, larger diameter of the nail as compared with the medullary canal, weakening of the femoral cortex via distal locking, as you can see here and stress concentration at the tip of the nail, localization of the fracture, majority of the time at the tip. And this is an example, a stress riser during internal fixation, fracture tend to occur at the end of the implant, mostly it is a spiral fracture, removal of the nail, revised with a long PFN, and patient had a unventable union. So the 240 or 250 mm nail, crosses the mid diaphysis where angulation is maximum. And you can see here angulation is maximum and therefore it touches to the shaft and tight canal will produce a stress riser effect. You can see impingement by the tip of the nail against the anterior cortex of the femur in excessively bowed femur in a low ladies is a very common finding which you see and therefore this type of a design requires a long PFN or you can use a short PFN, which is 18 centimeter. So that 24 centimeter nail or 25 centimeter nail will give a impingement effect. So early nail design were straight, newer design match shape of the femur with a slight mismatch. Even this also, there is a some mismatch do occur even after a anatomical nails. So this is an example of a mismatch between the radius of curvature of the nail and the bone when long nail is used in elderly patient. And you can see here, there is a anterior cortex impingement at the supracondylar level. And there is also a some mismatch at the fracture side, which has led to the mal rotation at the proximal fragment. So uh, these are the stress points, and these are the stress points for the suprapatellar nail, or we can say a distal femoral nail also, and this is for the anti-grade nail. Approximately three centimeter of the femur length, distal to the anti-grade nail, and about five centimeter retrograde nail being unprotected and coupled with osteoporosis is the predisposing cause for a stress point and leading to the fracture in anti-grade nail and, and the retrograde nail at the tip of the nail. Example, you can see here, a left femur subprochantic fracture treated by long PFN showing the fracture at the distal tip. You can see here status healed fracture and then ultimately because the subprochantic fracture healed, it has been removed and removal of the nail and locking plate was, surgery was done. So message in an elderly patient with a subprochantric fracture neck of the femur when using a long nail, please check lateral view of a distal femur under IIT if the nail is not progressing as expected in a soft white canal. That's further hammer blows can shatter the anterior cortex of the femur. So this is an example, a 43 year male sustained this fracture, short nail, you can see her fracture healed, I think so. And then ultimately what has happened, again in the fell down from the scooter, sustained a perinailer fracture through the empty hole and a spiral fracture extending into the procanter. And this is in the substance of the nail, this fracture is there. So torsional load consequently led to the spiral fracture around the nail. And you can see here it is mimicking the Vancouver B3 type of a fracture. So ultimately, this was treated by a long PFN with the circulage wire post-surgery after two years of follow-up, everything healed. Another example. So choice of implant, whether it is used a long or short, right? the evidence said that the, in the sub unstable trochanteric fracture and subtrochanteric fracture require a long PFN is the choice of implant rather than a short nail. 
This is an example again, unprotected distal femur in osteoporotic bone in a healed subtrochantric fracture with a trivial fall. And you can see this is the unprotected area, spiral fracture, localization around the tip of the nail and commonest fracture to occur in osteoporotic bone in a <coughs> distal femur. So this is how it is revised with a locking distal femoral plate, distal femoral complications following anti-grade intraminal placement is a very common finding and this has to be dealt with. And if at all, if you want to use a nail, it should reach to the supracondylar area and there should not be any bare bone like this. Otherwise, it will produce a stress fracture in an osteoporotic bone. This is an example. PFN surgery, this is the locking nail is done for the tibia, successful proximal femoral nailing and distal tibia nailing fracture healed. And after 10 years of follow-up, you can see a fracture has occurred at the age of 75 supracondylar region. These are the common thing which can happen here. And ultimately, this has been revised with the locking plate, keeping the nail in situ because it was difficult to remove. So, these are the fractures, they come in the substance at the distal, at the tip, at the proximal. They are not very well described in the literature and this radiological and functional outcome of the same patient after one year follow. So peri-implant fracture proximal to a long retrograde tumor nail, low energy peritrochantric fractures may happen in the presence of retrograde nail in the femur, fracture at the tip of the nail, and this is now a recently described in the Journal of Orthopedics, Trauma and Rehabilitation. So if you get a retrograde nail, probably the treatment is uh, very easy. You have to exchange the nail with the long nail or you can use a additional plate or a condylar blade plate. So this is an example, a distal femoral junctional comminuted fracture treated by a multi-lock supracondylar femoral nail and you can see after three months of follow-up, stress fracture at the screw hole, no signs of healing and locking bolt here, you can see here. So these are the things which you can see in supracondylar fracture. These are new cases are coming up and this is the complication not very well described in the literature. So nail in situ and revised with a condylar blade plate and I am waiting for the results. Another example, you can see a peri-implant fracture proximal to a long retrograde tumor nail, unlocked nail, there is an empty hole of the screw at tensile stresses. Ultimately, the fracture has occurred, maybe a typical fracture, and around the nail, near the tip of the nail, and this is taken from the Journal of Orthopedic Trauma and Rehabilitation, just to show that the fracture after a retrograde nailing can occur at the screw hole junction if they are kept empty or if they are locked, you can get at the tip at the intertrochantric lever. Ultimately, the author has revised with the condylar blade blade, keeping the nail in situ and aligning the fragment. Another example, a resultant forces and compressive stress are much more at the subtrochantric level, you can see here. This is another case which I operated, a supracondylar, uh, this is the fracture, and you can see here supracondylar fracture is was treated by this distal femoral nail, and then a condylar blade plate for the fracture neck of the femur. Ultimately, this has given way, and you can see here how the compressive forces and stresses work at the uh, subprochantric level. And this is another stress fracture you can see here. So this is a new complications are coming up, whether they are because of the stress or because of the atypicality of the subcogantry region, very difficult to say. Another example, fracture at the proximal end of the retrograde femoral nail, because this is all a bare area, unprotected area, stress area, and fracture neck of the femur or intertrochantric fractures are common, but they are very easy to tackle, just additional aid may be required. So radiograph taken after three year post fixation fracture has healed. Another example, this is at the tip, 
an intertrochantric unstable fracture, and you can see peri-implant IT fracture after a retrograde nail, and ultimately it was treated with the condylar blade plate and the fracture has healed. So the Virgilis classification system and chance classification system did not consider fracture proximal and distal to standard centromedullary IM nail, fracture proximal to the IM nail, whether fracture united, fracture non-united, fracture during the surgery or after the healing of fracture at proximal and distal. So very sparse literature is available when you use a centromedullary nail only it is available for a distal femoral nail and proximal femoral nail. So I will show you an example. This is the fracture treated by a nail and this was the non-united ultimately treated by a nail fracture united and after five years of follow-up this patient got a fracture neck of the femur. So this is the removal of the nail and abduction osteotomy and after two years of follow-up the fracture has completely healed. But if the fracture has not healed in the shaft of the femur, then the treatment becomes most complicated in such a situation. Another example you can see here, this is a non-united fracture and there is a fracture which is non-united, but the, the bone as well as the nail has broken through the interlocking screw away from the a non-united fragment. And this is the fracture taken from one of my colleagues from the Lata Mangeshkar. And you can see here how this fracture was treated by long PFN and bone grafting. And this is fracture has united. So very implant fractures, rare complication after intramodulary fixation of prochantric femoral fracture. Take home images. If the original fracture has healed and it is stable fixation can be achieved by nailing, the fracture should be treated by exchange nailing to a longer intramodular nail. You can see here, short nail, there is a fracture. It has to be converted with a long PFN and the fracture probably will heal. Another, when the healing of the original fracture is uncertain in that case, if there is a fracture of the shaft or a subprochantric region or a yeah, intertrochantic area. In that case, keep the nail in situ, remove the screw, and you can have an additional plate with or without bone grafting. So in conclusion, options after perineal fracture, proximal, distal, whether it is healing, non-healing, stable, unstable configuration, and depend on the fragmentation and implant in situ, our treatment revision plan it will be a different for each and every case and there is no fixed protocol for the management of a perineal fracture. However, both revision surgery with exchange nailing and locking plate or adjuvant locking plate osteosynthesis appear to be an adequate treatment whether you keep the nail in situ or exchange it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Very much. <clears throat> Thank you, Gadi Gone, sir, for a wonderful composition and compilation of cases of very implant fracture, especially with the nail. Uh, Dr. Sanjeev Gaur wants to comment. Please, sir. Uh, Gadi Gone, sir, um, what is the role of uh, short uh, nail PFM? Short. Do we uh, still, because generally you do a short PFM, introchantric fracture. Uh, so having seen uh, so many complications you have shown of uh, a nail tip fracture, should we abandon it or use a long anatomical nail or people still use the short nail? I'm slightly confused. Uh, recent literature said that the unstable trochantric fracture and a subtrochantric fracture are preferred in part is a long PFN. For a stable type A and A2 type of a fracture, even 18 centimeter length implant is sufficient and there is anatomical as well as the uh, comparative study has been done relatively stable fracture they both they do well with the short as well as long but 24 centimeter length in a dwarf lady should be abundant and should not be used use 18 centimeter in a very proximal fracture in a subprochantric level or a high subprochantric level it is always better to use a long period.
ओकेटरल For some of them, the screw goes absolutely in, in in a horizontal or rather in a in a right angle to the nail. In those cases, what happens? We try to rotate PFN so as to get the screw in the center in the lateral view. Now, doing that, we are now not matching the intermediary canal. So think of something is rotated maybe only fifteen degree. but it is not with the original human bone uh, curvature so probably we fail if we do not pick up the right kind of a design of a pf so there are chances that in lateral view it looks very much uh, jammed nail but in atrial posterior view you may feel like okay you can go there is some space available but in lateral view no it is touching the anterior cortex so there is a design problem i i totally agree with you sir actually pfn whatever it may be as kanna sir said it is a over sold implant and i do agree that this is over sold implant complications are many and there are so many uh, problems with the pfn design whether you use a single screw or double screw probably you need to think over as a trauma surgeon whether to use uh, or you go by literature depends on your uh, uh yeah commitment but i think i totally agree with tanna sir that it is a war sold in plant thank heaven the thank heaven dr shiva is not here otherwise he will be back <laughs> <laughs> thank you gadi gane sir and now we have a lecture from dr tanna sir on junctional distal femur fracture how to achieve a stable fixation Slide. Yes, they are visible, sir. And you can be heard. Junctional fractures. The problem of the junctional fractures are when there is a transverse fracture. Proximally, it's a difficult to really reduce. As you can see, this is externally rotated. This is flexed. So to reduce this fragment, you got to need all the things which is required. Easiest will be an open reduction, but this can be managed even the closed reduction if you have the know-how. First and foremost, externally rotated fragment is internally rotated with a sand spin. Find out an entry into the piriform fossa because I feel all proximal femur fractures should have a piriform fossa point of entry. So you have it in AP and a lateral view piriform fossa entry, and this is flexed. so your k wire your guide wire will have to go into the flex position of the fragment so that you enter the medullary cavity now having entered the medullary cavity now you can take a control of the proximal fragment so now you ream it once you have reamed it you introduce this this device into the proximal part and having put the device into the proximal part with this f tool you will be able to get the reduction and once you get the reduction with the f tool and with the help of this closed reduction you will be able to achieve once you get the closed reduction guide wire passes through and this f tool is very important and is very useful for such situations once the guide wire passes through reamer and a nail and you will be able to get the good fixation still you see here there is a small opening here probably here the point of entry should have been a little more medially then this point of entry this will not happen anyway it held up very well into 9 months time and this is the one transverse fracture is hardly ever a problem except a except a reduction now you can see here this is the thin nail in a wide medullary cavity in the proximal femur fracture is not that good for the end nail there is a very thin nail even proximally it doesn't have much hold and even distally it doesn't have much hold so this thin nail which is like this it will give rise to the movement and you will always get the instability there so thinner the nail particularly 
when it is not having any hold on to any of the fragment, is not a good situation. Now this oblique, this butterfly fragment or this, this fragment, they need to be made one piece. This is years back we used to do this, uh, where it was a circlage, some screws I have put in, and at the end of six months, with the nail, it has built up. Today we all know very well, the circlage is easily available. So this fracture on a fracture table, you can reduce it, or even without the fracture table, you reduce it. Put a circlage. Once you put in a circlage, it becomes a very one piece completely. So transverse fracture and a spiral fracture, well treated by nailing, as the construct is stable. May not need circlage as a joint. Must be done for a better healing, as bone continuity is established. And this bound fragments together can now sustain the forces of the muscle. But this femoral artery, which is passing by, you got to be careful before you do the circlage and you take up the circlage. I'll come to that a little later. Such oblique fracture or a slightly spiral fractures, they are better treated with the circlage and the nail. Then I think the healing is hardly ever an issue and you will be able to get the things going perfectly well. This sort of a fracture, this sort of a fracture, when you do the circlage, it becomes one stable construct. Once you've done the circlage, it's a stable construct. Whether you do the circlage by closed methods or by an open method, depending upon what is available to you. This sort of a fracture, no circlage was used, and you can see the proximal hold is very poor. And there is hardly any, any is only bone opposition, which is also not very good. And this piece is there. That's the reason this went into non-union. But almost a similar fracture, almost a similar fracture. You do a circlage, you get one piece reconstructed. And even if you do open reduction and do the circlage, I don't think it is any sin at all. So why not do a reduction circlage and get early certain union? So these short oblique fractures or a spiral fracture, they are ideally treated with circlage. But if you do the circlage and you end up into circlage like this, this is from the Google, you end up into circlage like this, then it's not good enough. So don't hesitate. If you have to go down and open it up, you open it up. Now, if you ended up with this, I feel there is no point in just leaving that. In these situations, I would go ahead and put an adjuvant plate. These are the ones where you see the femoral artery. It's very safe to do at this level and this level. But if you go more proximally, the chances of femoral artery getting affected are comparatively more, or if you go more distally. So that's the reason why you have to be careful when you're doing this circlage by the new AO method, which is there. Today, I recommend all subtrochanteric fractures which are communicated like this are not necessarily stable with nailing alone. I strongly suggest they be treated with the nail and edge one plate or a circlage. This may be an overkill, but we are taking a human being and he or she has to have her own life. So overkill is not a sin. I feel overkill is a must in orthopedics. This sort of a fracture in an elderly person, circlage is done and this still after the circlage also I felt is not stable enough. So I went ahead and did the plate and the patient is walking about in five weeks time. You can see very well. Such a comminuted fracture, when you do the nail, even if you do circlage, it is not going to be that stable. So this ended up into a non-union and then ultimately it had to be treated with the adjuvant plate. I feel on day one, if you get a situation like this, don't hesitate. Put an edge one plate, it's not sin, and then you will not be able to have a situation where it goes into non-union, patient goes on for four months, six months, again comes back either with a broken nail or with a non-union, and then you will have to do it at the second stage. And as you can see, the, all this breaks down because of the situations which is unstable. Now, this subtrochanteric fracture, this is of commonest occurrence occurring. As you can see, the subtrochanteric fracture proximally, where is the hold? Surgeon has done this. Proximally, there is hardly any hold. There is one screw which is from the thing that is not really holding. And so that's the reason why if there is a good hold lower down, but proximally, there is no hold. Such situation, what's the use of treating this fracture subtrochanteric, which is very, very notorious for 
non-union. Or you can see this fracture. Only this proximal uh, JG2 LT screw is there. Even if there was a screw which was going here, this is a very unstable mm -hmm. fracture. So ultimately, five years, eight years, nine years, this went into non-union and carried on like this. So this is the reason I feel when there is no hold on to this, on day one, in a plate, you will not trigger it at all. All these are the ones which you see subtrochantric fractures. Even if you put a circlage, if the hold is not very good, there's not going to be any hold on. So go ahead and put in a plate. There is no harm in doing this. All this is the one which is occurring. As you can see here, when you rimmed it, with the big rim is there, you've done the nailing, and this is the one proximally is not giving a good hold. The subprochantric factor is very, very notorious. You see here, this is the one which is communicated and the nailing has been done. This is very unstable. This goes on and on and on and ultimately it had to an H1 plate and the thing ultimately held up. And as you can see, in four years time, everything has held up. But you see, this is day one. This is day one. Where is the hold in the proximal fragment? You put one or two screws, it doesn't give you the hold. Even if you put in a screw here, it doesn't give you the hold, which is going to be that good with this sort of a proximal piece. So in this sort of a situation, day one, I'll augment this with the plate and may or may not graft. Mostly there will be no grafting over here, but I'll augment the plate, which I feel is absolutely necessary in this proximal side. Dominated junctional factors are unstable or only in nailing. So more non-union chances. So overkill, put in an adjuvant plate, and you will not have a regret. This fracture, I put in adjuvant plate, patient walks about almost immediately, and there is no problem with that, the fracture heals up. Now, this is a very common sight. When this piece is a long piece there, you pass the screw, and this always breaks down. Once it breaks down, once it breaks down, the construct is very poor, this breaks down here, you put in there, and this is the reason the nail breaks down. This is a very poor construct. So there is no point in that. And you can see this can be very well treated with the adjuvant plate, and then the fracture heals up with a superb stability. So why not any doubt on day one to this? When I saw this case in a meeting, some commented it could have held up only with positive reduction PFM. This is an overkill. I'll agree. But when you're doing a second or a third surgery, can you take any chances? Over the is only for half an hour of surgery and patient has no time constraint during surgery. So I feel every human being has to have a chance of first mm -hmm. operation healing. And even if that is an overkill, I don't think there is any harm. Why should there be no overkill in first surgery? He spends four to five months and the money and the, in the first surgery. And if the second surgery is to be done, it is six to eight months, it passes by before the second surgery is done. So he will be away for about eight months, nine months or a year. So in orthopedics, I feel it's a really big, heavy price to give. So overkill is not a sin. And all these things is done, it doesn't harm the patient at all. All this nailing which is there in proximal femur, you can see there is a white canal or this, this, all this is the one which is never going to heal up. On day one, you put an adjuvant plate. This is the best chance for this jumpsuit fracture to get up. All this is a fracture. Either you can do a circlage. I have no, no objection against circlage. You can do a circlage or you do an adjuvant plate. This is for the non-union. So it was an adjuvant plate was done. But on day one, I would have felt this would be a very, very amenable to a circlage. And all these are the fractures which in a non-union, we always treat with the plate and the graph. So this is the one which all of us have been treating this and we know very well how beautifully it is done. Now only observation is when you put a nail and you put a plate, the healing takes a long time. Radiological healing takes a long time. But the patient walks about and move about without any pain. He goes on coming with the x-rays. Three months it has to still not heal up. And probably it takes six, eight months for a good callus formation and the complete Completed healing, which we see here, it takes a longer time to get up. And if you put in a plate, don't put a small, piggly little plate like this. This is not going to be the effect. This is too short a plate and it's not going to be functional. 
Now I come to the junctional fractures of upper two thirds and the lower one third. This is the one which is the bugbear. I feel this is the one which is the commonest non union we see in the shaft femur is this junctional fracture. And this junctional fracture, when we see with the non union, 14 month non union, it so beautifully heals up with the adjuvant plate and the medial graft. So this is the one which I feel that if you're treating it with the adjuvant plate and the medial graft for a non-union, why should you wait for the non-union to occur? This is a very poor customer, as we all know very well. Again, this is the fracture, non-union, we treat it like this and it becomes all right. You see the fracture, one and a half year, it went into this non-union, walked after 24 months, she was an orthopedic surgeon's wife, so obviously treated by the best of the surgeons in the city. But you, you can see this. This is, this is so very unstable construct that it is floating. You can see my slide? No, sir, your slides are not moving. Uh, but, 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 now you can see the slide, the previous slide which I moved. No, it is the same one with a long plate, which you talked, I think, before about two, three minutes. Is it orthopedic surgeon's wife? No, no. The slides are not moving. So, uh, the slide with a nail and a long plate is seen, sir, with, with two brokers. Which is the slide you are seeing? Patient's name is Pranjal Kothari. Pranjal Kothari. I'll stop share and I'll come back. Yes, Now you can see my slide? Yes, sir. Okay. Beyond this. Slide 40. Yeah. Are you seeing the slide? Yes. Now we can see. Yes. Now, this is an orthopedic surgeon's wife. As I mentioned, she walked after 24 months. Now, here you can see distal femur. The hold in the lower end is very, very poor. There's a reason this is swaying and there is a lysis which is there. So distal femur, I feel, is the one which is very, very notorious. You can see again a distal femur, non-union. This is the one which you can see the not typical non-union distal femur. You see the CT scan. You see the nail is floating in the distal end. It's, it has a decent hold up bow, but there is a floating in the distal end. And this nail which is floating in the distal end, this is typical of a junctional fractures. Today, I feel... The junctional fracture, the option in a transverse fracture like this is a distal femur nail and not an anti-grade nail. Some surgeons talk about anti-grade nail with four screws or five screws is, is going to be as good, but I think I am not convinced about it. This either a distal femur nail, which is there, and then you can see the whole thing is held up. You can see after distal femur nail, there is no instability at all, and then there is a nothing was done. If I had found some instability, I would have added up a plate onto this. Some surgeons talk about this sort of a distal a proximal femur nail, uh, anti-grade nail with so many screws around is a better option. Somehow I am not very convinced about it. Now here it is. This was a fracture, uh, 
again a junctional fracture. He has an osteoarthritis knee, so I didn't want to do a distal femur nail. I did an anti-grade nail, put in an adjuvant plate, and the patient walks about on day one. And over the time, the fracture is completely held up. And this is what I feel is the one which is ideal. As you can see here, even three screws. Again, it has gone in for a non-union. The people talk about if there's a multi-directional screw, screw, then it will not heal up. Uh, then it will not go into non-union. But I feel it's not 100% sure. So I feel such a fracture, when it doesn't heal up, it needs an adjuvant plate and an anterior, and an anterior bone grafting. You, you do a medial bone grafting. You do a lateral bone grafting, it's not going to be good enough. And then ultimately heals up with this whole medullary cavity the SW. And when I talk about anterior bone grafting, I go around here. You see the line of weight bearing is always passing on the medial side in this side of the femur. It comes over here. So this is the one where I go around. I make in a cut. I do the shingling anteriorly, anterior medial, medial and posterior medial. And I put in a graft there, and then the plate is put subcutaneously. This is the way I do it. Few people feel that anti-grade nail will multi-axial, multi-smooth in distal end. If anti-grade, it may be better option. I don't think it is uh, all the time it is true. All such fractures, ultimately, when it doesn't heal up, needs a grade. Now, here was the fracture treated by a um, joint replacement surgeon. When he got a fracture, he gave this nail, which is a very poor constructor, as you can see. So naturally, they expected it had to go in for non-union. This is the stage I came. I treated with the plate and the anterior and the medial bone graft. It healed up. But this, if the surgeon was aware, it could have healed up very well with the nail and an adjuvant plate. Things would have become all right. So I feel you should, there should not be any hesitation in doing a day one adjuvant plate. I am convinced somehow that for a distal femur junctional fracture, safest thing is a nail and an adjuvant plate. There should be no chances taken. This is the best way. You can see a four screws distally, till it has gone into non-union. So that is the reason why you don't have to think about it. Osteoporotic fractures. If you put in this osteoporosis, even, even a thickest nail which was passed, there is no hole distally, no hole proximally. It has to have an adjuvant plate all the time. So these junctional fractures, I feel, more so in the distal part and the comminuted fracture in the proximal part, they should have an adjuvant plate. It's an overkill, but I feel it is a must. Upper junctional fracture, transverse fracture, or stimulus anatomically with closed or open circular is a better one. Mm -hmm. If comminuted and in doubt, adjuvant plate is a must. Lower junctional fracture, distal femur nail, and if needed, a plate is a must. I will take all the time. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir, uh, for wonderful advices on junctional fra uh, fracture yeah. and going almost for a overkill to fix them with rotational control it as well. Any questions to Tanas? Yes, sir. Yes. Uh, sir, uh, I just want to ask that we have now for encircolage multiple things available. So in all your experience, SS wires versus cable versus fiber, wire versus fiber tap. So anything we, we can learn that which is the better or which is the selective for which type of encirclage? Honestly, Jawar, except for the circular HB, just normal wire, I have no other experience. Anyone who has used other things? Jawar, I, Jawar, Jawar, Jawar. Yes, I, I have used fiber tap. You, you are the, ultimately a mechanical reconstruction of the anatomy. No, the only yet. better, I do not know. So what is what is very important with the fiber tap is there is an instrument available which can tighten up to 100 kg and 150 kg. So that instrument, we have some loose type of instrument where we do not know how far we have tightened it. But with the uh, fiber tap, the, the company is providing such instrument where you know very well that it is enough tighten. Otherwise, there is no specific advantage. And one more thing which I just want to uh, just uh, discuss is that I had a discussion with the companies who are manufacturing 
knee joint implant and i have just discussed with them that why don't you provide two three holes in the uh, femoral component where we can put a plate and fix it with the component so that in future if there is a peri implant i mean peri prosthetic fracture then we can use that holes to fix up the lateral plate i don't know it was just a discussion with the manufacturer see so at a international level to do this yes quite a lot of demanding the position probably locally we ask the manufacturer he may give you that but then there will be an objection whether it will make it loose whether it will get a fracture from that hole multiple and internationally you won't be able to convince people gaur sir you wanted to comment and then uh, uh, yeah. sandak yeah yeah gaur sir first then navin and then gadi mani sir please Tanna sir, uh, the role of augmentation plating is well established now in non-union. Now, I don't, I don't think it's overkill, but what are the specific indication you would use it primarily? Primarily today, I think in a junctional fracture lower down, where the medullary cavity is expanding, I would strongly suggest nail and a plate on day one treatment. And in a comminuted fracture, on the junctional fracture with the upper part, comminuted fracture, I will feel again a primarily on day one nail and a plate. If it is stabilized with the with the circular wire, then then that comminuted fracture, I feel that is strongly indicated. Thank Dr. you, Dr. Navin. You wanted to comment? Yeah, yeah. yeah. for circular wire i think that is it is it is a good tool for the reduction but the uh, giving the stability with the circular wire is a problem it get loosened uh, later on any 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 circular thing get lo loosened up so it it is a good tool for the reduction while you are making the stability and uh, alignment of the fracture and the second question to dr tanna sir is what is your take on the length of the plate when you are doing augmentation of the plate many times even if we put a short plate it works in a certain area but in certain area when a osteoporotic we have to put a very long uh, plate i would think i think eight hole plate two screws above and two screws below is as good but yes. i thought a plate i'm not very com very comfortable about so to gadi yes. your comments on this yes no, sir no, no, no. Uh, about the tape which tighten the screw which we the circular which we put in we don't really tighten it to make it issue yes not really it is ultimately it is an only only reduction tool the circular is only used as a reduction tool and not for a firm opposition from bone to bone so i don't know whether the tap will give you ischemia there when you tighten it set much i have no idea with this we we move on to the next lecture and i invite uh, Uh, Dr. Jav, uh, Dr. Vivek Trikha sir, to carry on his lecture on ipsilateral femoral shaft and neck It would be very interesting to know about concepts on femoral shaft and neck. Okay, so I'll be talking on the ipsilateral neck femur and shaft femur fractures. Um, as was said, it's a topic which we all have different ideas and different. over our own preferences so let's discuss what can we do the learning objectives of this talk are going to be understand the fracture morphology of these fractures which may involve the proximal hip rather than the neck in specific describe the various ways which are there to manage this fracture and learn how to achieve good outcomes based on evidence in the world as well as our own practices which we are following it's a challenging fracture 10% of all femur fractures involve the neck femur or the proximal hip young adult males are common one thing to note is that the shaft fracture is comminuted in the middle or third of the diaphysis whereas the neck fractures are basi cervical usually vertically oriented if you look at their powell's angle they will be more than 100 degrees if you really want to go and calculate but the better part is that most of them are non displaced and really many a times you nearly have to look for them while dealing with them the problems with these fractures is that 75 to 100% of them will have a multi systemic injury 
Most of them are in polytrauma situations or multiple fractured areas. And the other thing to note for us as orthopedic surgeons is that nearly 20 to 40% of the patients will have some sort of knee injuries along with this, be it a patellar fracture, tibial spines, proximal tibia or something. And you can look at the cases which I'll be showing. Many of them are having some sort of a fracture in the knee as well, which we have been seeing in our own cases. The various things to consider in an ipsilateral neck and shaft fractures is how to diagnose them, timing of surgery, whether you use a single or a dual implant, how to do the sequencing of fixation and what are the outcomes available. And these are the things which we will be discussing over the next 10 minutes. Remember, whenever we are dealing with such fractures, neck fractures are missed in nearly 20% of the shaft fracture cases even now with all our modern gadgetries. This is a paper which we published last year regarding the ipsilateral femur neck and shaft fractures of around 50 odd cases. And what we found was that even in our best of the centers, 6% of neck femur fractures were missed in shaft femur fractures when we had a low threshold of getting a CT scan. And CT scan is available at the drop of hat in my hospital. I'll just give you some examples. Now, this is a fracture or a pelvis fracture uh, X-ray. This is the X-ray in detail regarding the neck part. And if you look at detail, maybe you might have a look at that. In retrospect, we found out that there is a hairline fracture, which you can see vertically. I'm just trying to show you and highlight that out here. And once this goes in for fixation with the standard anti-grade uh, generation one nail, you have problems of a neck femur fracture. If you look at the CT scan in them and, and you are looking at the CT scan, it has to be one or two millimeter cuts. You will find that there is a complete fracture line in the axial scan, both in the anterior to the posterior cortex. In our paper, this is again a thing which we showed a fracture of the shaft of femur was fixed. And in between, it was found that there is a neck femur fracture, which had to be subsequently refixed with screws, from which was put in additionally from the same nail, and additionally besides the missile nail technique, and had to be reduced. I'll show you another case. Looks like to be a shaft femur fracture, distal third. The X-rays of the pelvis, as have to be done, have been done. They look normal. And it was routinely fixed in our emergency in our hospital. And when my resident showed me this X-ray, we said, why did you fix the neck and cephalomedullary thing was put? And he said he found a fracture inside in the neck femur while he was putting in this. And luckily for us, he had a cephalomedullary nail which was put and Cyrus sort of a nail because of which we were able to put in the neck fractures. So we went back and tried to see what was the thing. And we had a CT because many of these were polytrauma cases and in another hospital, the CT scans are many a times done for the abdomen part. And if you really, really look at these cuts, remember the cuts was done for the spine fracture. He had a spine fracture lower third of the L4, L3 region for which this cut of the CT scan was done. And if you see, this cut was not involving the hips. It was just involving the abdomen and the spine region in this cut. And so we didn't have any sagittal or coronal sections for the hip. We just had axial sections. And in, if you really look at the axial sections, you can find one fracture line going from front to back. So what we need to understand is that on retrospect, we were able to get an X-ray or a fracture line, a hairline fracture, which sometimes gets missed in spite of getting a CT scan. You just see a buckling of the posterior cortex of the neck in one or two cuts, and the rest of the cuts look to be normal. And then you are in for a surprise. This was fixed, as was done by my thing. And later on, you can see that it was an undisplaced fracture, went on to unite, and the distal shaft also unite. So what 
in our hospital, in our series, with the best of CT scans also available, you can see only the fracture line in one or two cuts. And even it is shown in the world literature that you can miss a neck femur fracture. You need to have a proper hip X-ray and internal rotation and get a CT scan of that area at one or two mm's to really, really look for neck femur in cases which are high velocity cases and you have a hiring decrease or increase in suspicion rates for these branches. So what do we need to do? We need to have an X-ray protocol of getting an internal rotation radiograph. Threshold for CT should be less and look out for a fracture which is undisplaced. Always and always evaluate under fluoroscopy during and at the conclusion of fixation of a femoral shaft fracture, which many a times we miss. Rotations and radiographs, if possible, in 10 to 15 degrees of rotation. But remember that in spite of that, we might still miss a fracture of around 3 to 5% in the world literature is still there. In spite of getting all these things done, we might miss an femur fracture. Then when do we fix this surgery and when do we fix these fractures? It's based on the high velocity and the ISS injury severity score, stabilize the life-threatening injuries first, and then you try to fix them as early as possible. Remember, they are very high and most of them are polytrauma patients. So maybe immediately you may not be able to fix and sometimes the damage control orthopedics also needs to be applied in view of his abdominal or other injuries. Prompt, but not an emergent surgery is usually done when there is a polytraumatized situation. Now coming to the sequence of fixation, neck or the intertrochantric region, or the shaft first. It is controversial. It totally depends from many surgeons' preferences and the choices. And what I'm going to show you is our preference in our hospital, which we have published also, and depends on the fracture pattern and displacement of neck femur or the IT for us. If you look at these fractures, there are two types of fractures which are along with combination with shaft fractures. One of them are the IT fractures, intertrochantrics, which are there along with the shaft. And the second one are the neck fractures. The neck fractures are usually basic cervical. Very rarely, they are subcapital fractures. So remember that these are the fractures. For the IT fractures, since your single implant and the fractures are in the same plane, it's most of the time we advise and we usually put in a single implant for an intertrochantric with a neck femur, with a shaft fracture because the fixation of one, which is anti-grade nail, can have an impact on both the fracture patterns. Whereas when the neck femur is there, which is away from the shaft and the medullary cavity, you can have the choice of a dual implant right in the beginning, because the impact or the fixation of the neck femur may be totally separate and will not be influenced by fixation of your femur shaft. So remember this, then many a times in intertrox, you use a single implant, but in a displaced neck femur, you might have to use dual implants. Let me show you one of the cases or this. This is an intertrochantric fracture. You can say the trochanter is involved with a shaft femur and the X-rays you can see of the pelvis also showing the same. Look at the patient. He was a 145 kilo BMI 40 patient having a neck femur or a shaft femur fracture with a distal third femur. We went about doing it the same way as I do all my cases. And what we found out, when we had to have difficult problems fixing on a fracture table, but here it's the surgeon's preference. What do you want to do? The way you have done before, that's what you are going to do. I'll show you his example to know and tell you how to reduce these fractures. So the first thing to ensure is that your middle fragment is got externally rotated. So until unless you derotate your middle fragment, be it for a neck or an intertrochantric, you are not going to get the proper rotations issue. So we put in a shan spin in the middle fragment. Then also, because of this sort of an epsilon sort, or you can say a similar sort of a fracture of the intertrog, we were not able to get the reduction problem. So another K wire or a big uh, 2.5 Steinman pin was put into the neck fragment to get both of them in the third view, which you can see to get the reduction properly by derotating them and getting the varus and the valgus alignment proper. And once we were able to do this, we put in, fired in 2 mm, 2.5 mm K wires 
holding the shaft, the middle fragment with the neck fracture while reducing and keeping them reduced in a minimally open position. Once we have been able to fix it with three or four wires holding the neck or the intertrochantric region properly, we then put in and started making our entry point at the medial part in the various ways which the normally we do. And then the standard nailing procedure was done. Once we had put in the nails, the intertrochantric region was fixed and subsequently the distal fixation was also done with the three screws in different planes. The problem which we encountered here was that our, to make our entry point more medial, it had to be close to the body. And once we had to put in from there, it was a huge incision just to put in a jig down because until unless we go from the superior part, they, all the incision had to be made was for the jig to go down right up to the tip. And ultimately we did his fixation like this, got an X-ray, not the best of the reductions, but we assume that it's an intertrochantric and we were happy with this reduction at his age and his body weight. And this is at four months that he was having fully united five months and he's back to his work. And thankfully he has reduced 15 kilos of his weight by now on our constant prodding performance. <laughs> But remember that that's how you need to reduce your fracture, be it an intertrochantric or a neck femur. Derotate the middle fragment, try to reduce the proximal fragment of the neck or the shaft and then do whichever way you want to. So for us, if it is a neck femur or a fracture, which is undisplaced neck femur, we normally tend to use a single implant and fix the shaft and neck simultaneously by putting in some preventive KYS before and then making our entry point. We hold the neck with KYS, make our entry point for the shaft and use the recon or a cephalomedullary nail, which is ideal for such cases. Here again, you can see some examples of neck femur fractures with shaft femur fractures fixed with a single implant. All these fractures have been fixed with a sort of different implants. You can fix it with any of the cephalomedullary single screw. You can fix it with double screws. You can fix it with PFNs, the old PFNs or you can fix it even with cases of lag screws which are there, or you can also fix them with intertans if you really require. So all these fractures which I've showed you have been relatively mildly displaced or undisplaced neck femur fractures. When we can be reduced on a fracture table, reduce and put in the preventive KYS for the neck properly first and use a single implant for such fractures for the fixation. If the neck femur is displaced or the fractures are widely displaced, there is commutation and most of them since being at basi cervical region, your CC screws may not be able to help off your cephalomedullary nails or, or without an isolated also then the fixation sequence or usage of dual implants is normally preferred, but the fixation of sequence, whether to fix the neck first or the shaft is purely as per surgeon's preference. We normally implant choice is based on the fracture pattern, the combination and the bone quality. And as I said, since it is a basi cervical fracture, we tend to use the DHSs more commonly than the CC screws with the neck retrograde nails, which are there. So my take will be a displaced neck femur, subcapital or basi cervical, we look at the neck femur fracture, we use a DHS with a retrograde nail or a CC screw with a retrograde nail, depending upon where the neck femur fracture is all over. We normally use a dual implant if it is a direct reduction or an indirect reduction, which we have to do or open up the fracture. And these are the various papers which are there in the world, which also have shown similar results with the usage of whichever implant which we can. You can use a single construct or you can use a dual construct. And as I said, this is what we practice in our practice, that if it is an undisplaced or a basi cervical fractures or intertroch, we use a single implant. If it is displaced basi cervical, we use DHSs. If it is displaced with neck femur, subcapital, we use CC screws with retrograde nail most of the time, but things can vary. Remember the literature says combination of implants is usually advocated for a displaced neck femur fracture. 
722 cases out of 65 studies, no clear superior implant choice. Both results, even in our study, so the results and the union rates were same, though we had around 80, 75% cases which were done with dual implants and 30 odd cases were 30% cases were done with a single implant. Neck femurs usually dual implants and intertrox usually with single. Functional outcomes are good. And remember that the series are very small and good, retrospective, most of the world literature, which is there. One thing to note in outcomes of neck femur fractures is that there is a delayed or a non-union of the shaft fracture more, which is up to 20 to 25%. Dr. Sangeet was also saying, and normally shaft femur diaphyseal fractures have roughly a union rate, non-union rate of roughly 2 to 3%. Majority of them, 98% of them roughly unite. But when you have an ipsilateral neck femur and a shaft femur, nearly 20% of the fracture shafts may not unite because the majority of damage and the forces have been there on the shaft. And neck is usually because of the abduction of the position of the femur or the hip while the forces are being propagated after the shaft femur fracture has happened. And that's why you have a vertical fracture and mostly the basic cervical fractures when this fracture happens. The neck femur has a low non-union rate of nearly 5 to 7% as compared to a 20 to 25% in a normal isolated neck femur fractures. Isolated neck femur has around 15 to 20% fracture non-unions, whereas here it is less, but the shaft is nearly 3 to 20 to 25% fractures. So that's what we need to take care of. And this was there in, even in our paper, where nearly 22% patients had delayed union of the fracture shaft femur for which other procedures were also required in few cases. I'll just show you a few examples. This is a polytrauma case, and most of them are polytrauma. Bilateral lower limb fractures, right side was a shaft femur with a segmental tibia, and the left side was a neck femur with a segmental shaft femur with a shaft tibia with an open wound. And this was the open wound on the posterior aspect of one of the legs. So how do we plan and what to do first? All the things which we have talked about may not work here because here the patient is a polytrauma patient and you need to many a times do the damage control orthopedics here. And what we were able to do in the first sitting was to manage those conditions as much as possible. So we fixed, we fixed some of the fractures on the left side. If you see the right side was put on a fixator and the left side, we put in for the segmental femur, a retrograde nail, leaving the neck femur, which was intertrochantric, away right now. We did not fix the intertroch femur on the left side right now because we wanted to fix the lower limbs as much as possible based on the damage control. One side, we nailed the segmental part of the femur and the tibia, and the right side we did with the fixator. The right side, as you see, we had fixed in with a segmental tibia and the femur were put in on a fixator. Once we were able to stabilize, you can see this is how the clinical condition of that patient was. And once the patient went into ICU and went uh, stabilized, then we reduced the neck femur fracture on the side of the segmental femur subsequently and changed the X-fix of the right side to the nails like this. Four years later, you can see that she has got the union part. The segmental fracture of the femur along with neck intertrochantric femur, which was there fixed with dual implants, has now fully united. And the left leg gave us some issues, but it also later on improved with dynamizations and fibular osteotomies. And this is her complete picture after five years of follow-up with the neck femur fixed, the segmental femur fixed on the same side and the subsequently the opposite side as well. So here the patient's life took priority and we had to change our sequencing of fixation to make sure that the physiology does not deteriorate further and the neck or the intertroch part could be managed later. So life first, then stage fixation and proper initial assessment is particularly important. Another case, basi cervical. See, most of these fractures are basi cervical. See the patella, which is broken out here. And here we fixed the same way as a retrograde or a dual implant fixation. But here we went about fixing the fem neck femur first to reduce it properly. And the same procedure was followed. We put in a shan spin to derotate the middle fragment, opened up the thing to put in our homens, 
put in our K wires and the guide wires in the central position in the lateral view, opening up, reducing the femur or the neck femur part with the, for a DHS in a standard way and fixing it with two hole DHS with a derotation screw, which was done for this fracture. And once this was done, then we went about fixing the distal fracture, which was there by a retrograde femur nail. But the problem which many a times happens with this is you cannot many a times decide your nail size, which should be overlapping. And you need to be very accurate here many a times, which is more easier once you do a DFN and then you can choose your DHS long barrel plate as per the length of your, DH, of the, your DFN and you can overlap them to avoid stress risers or PIFFs as Dr. Gadegone had shown. So this was the way you can see that this fracture was fixed. One of the screws of our DHS, which was a locking screw, was impeding upon our distal femur nail. And we could not have shortened the nail because if we had shortened, there would have been a stress riser in between them. So we put in as close to it as possible. Later on, we had to dynamize and remove that screw. And we fixed in and removed the dynamization, uh, removed the nail as well. And subsequently, you can see that the femur shaft, uh, the neck femur had united. The femur shaft also has united, though not looking properly out here. But finally, if you see, all the fractures have united, though it required the dynamization because the length of the nail and the overlapping of DHS was slightly an issue. Once you fix the intertrochantric or the neck femur first, and then do your DFN in the second manner. Whereas in the first case, which I showed you, we fixed the DFN first and then we went about fixing the leg femur with the DHS later, which is much more easier for us, I think, than doing this way. Another case of polytrauma who had polytraumatic abdomen situations, you can again see the patella, which is comminuted in the proximal bone. All these fractures were having some of the knee issues. Embolization for the splen was done, which was damaged. And the same procedure was done here with the DHS, with the derotation, along with the DFN, which was done. So here, once you normally, what we do is we fix in a DFN first, keep the length of the DFN around five centimeters below the lesser trochanter so that we can use a DHS around three to four hole DHS, which will overlap this DFN if we are going in for a dual implant. The patella at that time was not fixed properly and we had a lot of issues with this patella and the distal fragment of the femur, which was causing a lot of delayed union. You can see all these x-rays are at the same time, but the femur neck has united properly, but the shaft was still into a delayed union, which required some PRP injections and subsequently went on for union. And finally, remember that many of these cases go in for non-unions and give you a lot of trouble like this case, which was managed somewhere else, which was bad, horribly went wrong for the neck femur or the intertroch part, as well as for the shaft femur part, which subsequently we had to change in both the fractures with the retrograde nail for the shaft and a valgus osteotomy for the neck part. Remember the shaft femur still didn't unite in spite of our nailing, which was done. We another had to do another case for another some procedure for him after one year. We removed the angle blade plate. You can see the valgization is adequate. The patient is still fine, but I can tell you his shaft femur still shows the same gap. It is around five to seven years now, but the patient is having no trouble, but the x-rays still do not show me complete union of the shaft femur. You can still see these x-rays are now latest, some of the x-rays show that it still may not be united, though it is around seven to eight years post-operatively without any problem for the patient. So the message out here is choose a surgical plan that optimizes the anatomical reduction and adequate stabilization of the neck fracture. That is paramount for you. For the shaft, we need to restore the length, alignment, and rotation of the femoral shaft fractures. Remember that reduction and stability of the neck femur in displaced neck femur I'm talking of. In undisplaced, it's usually uniting. But in displaced neck femur, it is more important than the number of implants we are fixing. And hence, we normally tend to go in for a dual implant 
if the neck femur is requiring much more attention than the shaft femur for us. Remember, shaft femur out here is going to give you problems. It is nearly 20% failure rate of delayed or non-union in such cases, whereas the neck femur usually unites faster. Thank you for your patient hearing. Can I ask a question, Dr. Trikha? Sure, sir. It is well established that in ipsilateral scenario, the neck femur has less non-union rate and the shaft femur has a more non-union rate. And this is also with the segmental shaft femur also. The lower fracture has higher non-union rate. What is the reason according to you? It's not understood apart from the energy, high energy trauma. Yes, I fully agree with what you are saying because we are seeing fracture shaft femurs which are very high velocity, be it segmental or isolation when the neck femurs are not there. But they do not go into non-union to that great an extent. The problem for me maybe is that we concentrate more on the neck femur part than the shaft femur part, which we feel is not that important because of our regular practice, we are now roughly 3% or 2% of our shaft femurs ever fail or go into delayed or non-unions. Whereas what we need to understand out here is that this injury has been caused because of the hip inflection, knee inflection, the entire forces going on to the shaft, which are not breaking after the neck or the patella, they break the shaft, oh. distal third more combination. Mechanism is so high. And then as a corollary or later on, they, because of the abduction of the hip, the neck femur breaks in vertical fashion. So because of our general tendency and our normal practice in day-to-day -day orthopedics, we tend to give the neck femur more importance though it deserves, certainly deserves that importance when it is a displaced neck femur. But we do not give adequate importance to the shaft which it requires. And we normally tend to go in with a, what I feel many a times is we tend to go in with a slightly under rim nail most of the times, or we are not giving the adequate fixation to that part proximally or provide more instability than what can be given in such cases. And that's what leads to more failures for the shaft femur in combination with the mechanism and the soft tissue damage, which is already present and is not in our under our control. That's what I feel. Okay. Dr. Vivek, I have a, a small uh, uh, thought. That sure. is very well you have explained that one should check the neck region before you close because you are going to miss. So my thought is that... Uh, can we minimize these incidences of missing the neck fracture by simple clinical examination? If there's an anterior tenderness or if there's a tenderness of the biotrochanteric taste. So anything has been thought of or, or detailed in any of the publications that so, it can be minimized yeah. by a clinical examination? I have gone through the entire world literature for this fracture for and we were making our paper also last year, which was published. Because I was surprised that we, I thought we were doing a great job with our CT scans and getting all the investigations in our hospital without any money for the patient. And we found that in spite of getting CT scans done with one millimeter cuts, we were missing out on some fractures. And we retrospectively went and looked about it. There are world literature still says that in the best centers of America, be it with Paul Tonetta or with other people, they still miss out on 5% of fractures. They do get a scout CT done for the hip region in most of your high velocity trauma of the shaft femurs. And they have not been able to come out with a solution for this because the pain is such that you cannot pinpoint the pain to bitochantric test or any of those tests. However, Corey Collins paper from America has given us the so-called overkill of Dr. Tanna, which is there. That you use a cephalomedullary nail in all high energy shaft femur fractures. Why do you want to use a nail which is leaving the neck femur away, which subsequently within a week or sometimes which is an undisplaced fracture may develop a fracture which is bicortical and come subsequently come up within a week or 10 days. 
So there was only one paper from Corey College, which is saying that in his practice, what they have started doing is that for every shaft femur fracture, which is a high velocity fracture, they are fixing the neck as instead of the two horizontal screws of the locking, they are all putting them into the neck because even if there is an undis... I showed you my two CT scans and those were retrospective observations, which we also could not find out until unless we looked at the X-ray intraoperatively and the CT correlations to see that this was a fracture which was there only in one or two millimeters. To obviate all those issues, they say, why not just simply put in the two screws in the neck so that you can go about it. That's the safest way out. Oh, yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. The reason why they are missed out is... Uh, Usually, the, these patients, they have polytrauma. They are other injuries, like chest injury, head injury, abdominal injuries. And the priority is to that. And as a, they are in ICU, uh, critical care. And as a part of routine x-ray, since there is a deformity, only shaft x-rays are taken. And uh, the neck part are most often undisplaced, as uh, Dr. Vivek also pointed out. And that is a reason you will not elicit any tenderness uh, in the situation. Second thing is this neck femur behaves differently from a normal neck femur where the non-union rate is almost 25 to 30 percent. We don't have so much non-union when we have a ipsilateral shaft and neck. And uh, uh, also uh, you pointed out like if it is a car seat injury, the impact is first the shaft where it is a high velocity injury and then it is transferred on the neck. And it is also interesting if the patient is sitting in adduction or abduction. Acetabulum comes. <laughs> exactly. The next is the acetabulum, a yes. central fracture dislocation. So these are what is published in the literature. Yeah, Naveen, please go ahead. What Dr. Gore said is why there is a more uh, percentage of non-union of the soft femur. The commonest mistake we make when you use a single implant we to get the valgus in the neck femur, we do a over traction, and then we forget to release the traction before locking the distal screws. So many times it remains slightly distracted because we have done an over traction, and we are fed up with the long surgery. And the second thing is many times these fractures are infraestimal. From the primary, it was requiring some augmentation plate from the very beginning because we cannot have a uh, two screws above and two screws below in a single direction where we get a rotational stability. So it is again an invisible instability which are not we are noticing on that day because we are fed up with the long procedure. And the third thing what Dr. Vivek told, since last 15 years we have not done routine femur nail. We are doing neck elements and the nail because that is the safest way. Okay. Uh, Vivek sir, may I ask you one sir. question? Is yes, there sir. relation of a blood supply with the distal femoral fracture with ipsilateral neck and shaft? Because the most of the perforators, they go in you know, proximal two-third of the femur. And relatively, distal femur is a relatively a bare area with a lack of blood supply. No, it is relatively, relatively as compared to the uh, proximal femur. Is there any correlation uh, with the distal femoral non-union in a... Uh, floating fragments. It's a floating fragment. You can say the blood supply from the proximal edge cut off, from the distal edge cut off, so that the middle fragment, it's an isolated intercalary fragment. So what is your uh, take on this? Uh, there are not any evidence or literature at present. I wouldn't say evidence, but literature on this aspect of having a disturbed or vascular supply for the middle fragment. But certainly, as we are looking at in the isolated shad femur fractures also, the junctional fractures and the distal fractures which are there, which are most commonly the fracture patterns which we observe in neck femur or intertocantric with shad femur fractures is nearly on the distal third fracture and the upper two-third distal one-third junction. We just now heard Dr. Tanna also showing that the junctional fractures are the ones which are going in for non-unions or delayed unions with our standard nailing system and the mechanisms, and they require much more stability as per his experience 
because the biology is still maybe precarious, but the stability is more required, which takes more time to throw callus and the unions are happening in delayed fashion. And in, when we are having a dual fracture in the same frac limb or the same segment, we are already compromising, as Dr. Tucker was saying, on the fixation of these fractures by either using a smaller nail or not fixing them properly in the proximal fragment because we need to fix the dual segment as well with the DHS or some other fracture or some other implant. And the distal part is also not so greatly in fixed in proper ways in the multidirectional ways. So I feel that it is a, both a combination of a decreased vascularity, which is already present in all the fractures of the distal third femur shaft fractures, which is junctional fractures. Along with that, the notional less stable implants, which we use for the shaft femur here, vis-a-vis -vis more concentration for the neck femur that we do in such cases, which both of them combine together to give us these non-union rates, which are pretty high. If you really look at it in a diaphyseal fracture to have a 20% failure rate, Nobody is going to use that implant if we really look at it in an isolated shaft fractures. But still we are going on and thinking that it is part of the job or something like that. We nearly need to concentrate on fixing the femur properly or maybe augmentation of that as was shown by Dr. Tanna and other people as well who are using it for an isolated junctional fracture of the femur as well. And I've done that in non-unions of these fractures and I've put in an augmentation plate along with the valgus osteotomy and they unite within three months. That's what I've seen. With this so the sta stability, stability is under our control and we yes. should use that our ability to give the stability. Biology is not in our not certain right. hand. So biology Very can true. be taken care of after six weeks or three weeks or eight weeks if it's not uniting. So thank Very you sir, for your excellent yes. presentation. And now move, move on to a next topic of a uh, Dr. Jawar Jetwa's uh, uh, topic on uh, medullary fixation. Happy fixation, what he says, elastic fixation is a happy fixation. <laughs> Thank yes. you. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Uh, basically, I am going to talk more about the shaft femur fracture on a couple of the slides for the proximal femur. But before I start, let me give one more hint that if you are able to ask the patient to do internal rotation on the next day, there are chances that you might pick up that you have missed uh, neck fracture because he will not be able to do active internal rotation after the sharp fracture femur. So now let me start with this. Uh, So I'm going to talk about titanium nails, stainless steel elastic nail, and also ender nails, and some points on maximum curvature point, and ender nailing for the sharp femur, which is also in a various condition, it is possible. Some case-based messages, some technical aspects of modified ender nailing, and also some part of uh, you know the final locking nails and all those things. So let me start with that. That ender nail is a stronger than titanium nail elastic nails, particularly for the pediatric, because often we are not satisfied with the um, elastic nail because it becomes a little bit more weaker. And these are the cases where I have just found out a couple of the images from internet that it may go for an regulation after fixation. During fixation, it was not there. So in any younger children, there is no problem, but for the older children, you can go with a post-fixation angulation if they are elastic, which are very thin. So what we can do is that we can think of a stainless steel nail. So this paper says that there is a complication where it is four times higher in titanium elastic compared to stainless steel elastic. And this is very important that we should know that up to 35% complication is there versus only 16%. And that is something very important for us to know. But so when you go with the uh, uh, ender nail, which is much stiffer, then the chances of this post-fixation angulations are less. So whenever possible, it is good to use these things and you can avoid uh, angulation because they are much stiffer and much stronger. And this is the way we can get a good function and without any post-fixation angulation. 
And there are a couple of other papers which say that the tan and stylus, uh, stainless steel elastic nails, there is no difference. The only difference is this one third cost. Another says similarly, the overall trend is in favor of stainless steel elastic nail, especially being cheaper than tan nails. And the another paper says that tan nails and SS nails are equally effective. So why not to use something which is less costly, that is stainless steel nail. Uh, about the maximum curvature, we all know that we have been trained that let us try to put that maximum curvature or we can say spindle or whatever at the friction side. But what happens when you see multiple cases which have been healed on the internet and we can see that it may not match the maximum curvature, but still it goes with a good amount of uh, healing. So curvature is not in our control. So better we use a good implant and good stability and we may not be able to do that. This is a simple thought which is in my mind that on one side we are talking about a maximum fixation at the fracture side. On the other side we say that to boost union we must avoid rigid fixation near the fracture side. So both of things are probably uh, particularly in an older age I mean, older pediatric age, like more than 10 years or 12 years or 14 years, this may be the thing which you can thought of. Now, let me go to some of the conditions with end nail. It's a good end, uh, implant for polio patients where you have a very good fixation uh, by the end nail for the shaft femur fractures. Especially for the upper third or lower third where you are not able to prepare, they put the apex exactly at the flexor side, then stiffer nails are better. And these are the other cases where you can see that you can get a good fixation in a length unstable fractures. So when you are using in a pediatric, when the dense medullary bone stock is there, it plays a major role and you will be able to prevent a further shortening because it is in a pediatric age of group, the dense medulla is going to hold these nails very well. So in pediatric femoral shaft fracture, subtrochanteric fracture, elastic nail is very well accepted. Multiple literatures are there. I don't know what happens on the 18th birthday. And why we think now from 12 midnight, you are not fit for endonailings or elastic nail. So something which we have to think of, the difference between published science and the practice science, and we have to think and consider and we have to overcome some of the indicated cases where you can use uh, the routine implants and also the elastic nails. So point is that in all these cases, you can use in an in a adult also elastic nails like under nails for the fractured femur. And in a, especially in a polytrauma where you have a, a problem of uh, embolism, where you don't want to pressurize the medullary canal with a reamer and with the interlocking nail. There you can do with this elastic nails and you can get a beautiful reduction, beautiful union in time without any complications. And there are a couple of cases where there could be a, a exteriorly, I mean, a length unstable fractures like this. But if the patient is relatively young and the medulla is very dense, you can go with end nail and you can get a very good result with this end type of Y configuration of such fractures where all these things come together and ultimately you get a full union with a good function, almost normal functions. One more point which I want to just say technically is that when you want to remove the nails, it may be under nails or any other nails, you try to locate with the sharp instrument under IITV in both the views and then you can go and just make a gutter with some instruments but thereafter, when you put a hook and when you are removing these nails, please put a, a betadine sock ghost piece because these nails tend to have a good suction because of the vacuum inside and then it will suck in the air. So there is a possibility of infection. Doing this, it will suck the antiseptic solution rather than. So under nails is the aptly flexible, aptly stiff, adequate press fit force due to elastic recoil, long area of subcortical contact that also gives a no friction and better fixation and can be pushed up to the bone surface so you may not have a protruding, uh, irritating ends like which is in a 10 nail. And it is easy to remove because there is an eye which you can use a hook and you can remove that. 
a uh, very important discussion we had in the morning that there is a very high bow in a osteoporotic female 70 in all those cases you can use andernase because it accommodates whatever is the curvature at this age and you can jolly well uh, get a good contact on both sides and you can get a good reduction regarding the uh, a fracture with a tikia there is a possibility of passing andernase by the side because femoral component is having an area on the medial side, also on the lateral side where you can negotiate it. This is one of the cases where there was a sharp fracture in the middle and we have just passed this uh, uh, endonase and it has gone for a healing without any event. And we can keep the, uh, the femur, I mean the TPR implants safe. This is another case which is uh, my senior's uh, uh, mother who came across this Septocentric fracture with the same side TKR, where very carefully we can negotiate this endonase and we can fix this fracture very well in a Y configuration, which is a modified endonailing. And there is a good amount of, uh, I mean, there's a good union. Of course, there is a little bit of uh, going on the varus side, but when I calculate it, it is only 125. It was not exactly the varus. But at the end, what happens? If there are some problems, even there is some irritation at the end of the nail, when you remove it, still we can keep the TKR implants unhurt and we can have finally the same movements and same uh, functions of TKR as well as the fracture which has healed at the hip region in the proximal region. Sometimes we come across this problem, which is not a very, uh, I mean, it is a lower third fracture, but still distal to this also, the same technique, which is called simultaneous medial and lateral uh, insertion of the nails with two surgeons with two sets of instruments. So what happens in such cases, you can pass nails from both sides. And then the question of a distal canal, which is more roomy, does not happen because you are passing the nails from the side, which is having a subcortical sort of a fixation. And if you look at at the end, uneventfully, this goes in a very good fix, I mean, reunion with a good function. And so in such cases, what we do is that we have two sets of instruments. There are two surgeons that are simultaneously passing because in such cases in a lower one third, if you try to pass one nail, then it, there is a natural translation of the fracture and you will not be able to pass the second nail. So bit by bit, just as a point we start, and then it can be done. So this is the very, uh, I mean, a good method in a lower third diaphyseal fracture, not the metaphyseal fractures. This is another case which was like this, very heavy patient. At the time of injury, he was more than 110 kg. He has reduced, but then with this method, we could go away with a distal third fracture very well with foot function. Regarding double fracture, yes, you can use the same modality. You can fix the proximal fracture with a CC uh, turbo screw as well as interfragmentary screw and also in Y fraction, Y configuration, you can go with the ender nail and both of that can be treated very well. Similarly, for the segmental fractures, you can use these elastic nail. Everything can be very well roped in all the fragments and it can be having a very good reduction of the fixation. Now, my point is regarding the understanding of anti-version and anti torsion the first figure you can see there is no anti version no anti torsion that means it is not a normal bone just for the sake of explanation i have just drawn this thing it is anti torsion when the lateral trochanter also is put posteriorly again this is not normal human bone the normal human bone is that the tip of the trochanter is lateral but after the intertrochanteric line Trochanteric line, it goes anterior. So, antiversion is a word which is specifically for the proximal part as a pertrochanteric line. Anti torsion is what we do when we rotate the implant and try to put into that. So, in cases of a postrolateral slit, the problem is that if you try to avoid the postrolateral slit, you put an implant, it goes into the posterior part of the head, sometimes out of the head. So we need to have an implant like this, which is not possible. This is just, I have mocked the particular picture, which is not possible to pass an angled uh, DHS screw. Or in that case, for the PFN also, we cannot have an angled screw. 
So for this reason, for antiversion, obviously it is not possible to ban the hip through. These are the cases with the postural slit which you have missed probably with not having a CT scan where you can think of rather than rotating and putting into that, there is a method where you can go with a CC screw interference screw which is in the anterior part and thereafter all these very well contoured nails and thereafter the turbo screw. So the questions of the lateral wall is can be avoided once you can avoid the slit which is on the lateral side. And these are a couple of the things which are part of the modified nailing where we can use this uh, very well contoured nails and with the elastic hood clamp and we can avoid <clears throat> such complications. The methodology is like this that you are putting a curved nail which derote, I mean, which keeps or prevents the external rotation. And this modified the nailing, uh, the elements are like enhancing the uh, press fit hold is by pushing this particular screw in between this particular nails. So it gives as a turbo and it deviates the path of the nails inside the head, which increases the uh, grip of that. So if I just give you this, a particular uh, GIF which I have prepared, you can see that it, it touches the nails in IP and lateral view and then it, it disturbs the path of the nail by which the total grip inside the head and neck increases. And that's how we are getting there. Very important thing for the end nail is that this five very important contouring which we have to do the, 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 the sagittal two, uh, two curvatures and the coronal another three curvatures. Each of them have their own roles to play, which I have explained very well in my YouTube uh, video, but this is very important. And there could be any type of configurations like this. You can use the screw first or the nail first or the nails or without any screw. All these things are the uh, combinations and different variations depending on the fracture geometry. So even at the age of 74, you can do a next day walking if everything is very well planned and if you can fix it and can reduce with this methodology of modified end nailing. Similarly, you need to employ all the smart techniques, which all our stalwarts and all our seniors and other people like Dr. Shiva Shankar and so many have said that use your old methodology to get the reduction best. Thereafter, you can show have your own choice of uh, implants, but the reduction is very, very important that in all views, you try to get the best of reduction. So all modifications play a role. And when you, everything you do accordingly, you will have no knee complaint, no external rotation, very good fixation without any loss of reduction to the initial. In cases of a very high angle, like 140 degree angle, you might not get a good uh, EFN good, uh, at 145 degree. In those cases, you can use this modified handling where you will have a full recovery at 18 months, which I was just showing, showing you in this particular case where you can maintain similar to the opposite side and patient will not have a limb length discrepancy. When you have an osteoporotic patients with so many different comorbidities, you can use this technique, get best of the reduction with multiple images which I'm showing and also a clip at the distal end. And very important part is that all challenges can be overcome. And if you look at all this axis, there is no lateralization of the trochanter and that also helps in an abductor force where patient is happy to get uh, the reduction in a normal anatomical positions. Regarding the lateral combination, if such fractures are there, you try to push on only on the medial side and non-return axial push with musculofacial ligamento taxis plays a role. And such fracture also can go with a good healing without loss of any reduction, and you can have a very good squat and smile at the end of 18 weeks. No proximal noil entry, no open reduction, no tension bend wiring, no butter spread, restored anatomy, and full grade power at the end of the full healing. A very important point for the subtrochanteric fracture that no other plant can induce such a dynamic valgus force when you are passing the nails from the lateral uh, condyle of the femur to the of the trochanter, which will prevent virus in due course of 
healing. So this is a matter where you can use and you can prevent. Look at this very bad fracture. And at the end, there is a happy fixation because of this modified. And this is another case where you can see reverse fracture, which is very stable. And this can also be very well treated with this method very simply. And in these cases, what happens is that, uh, you know, as an effective implant, you are getting something like this. And that is the reason why there is a very good grip inside of the medullary cavity, which will not allow displacement of the fractures and you can get away without any additional implants. Uh, the last slide is that there is a future. We are working on this where we are thinking of putting a, a locking endonail so the eye is having a thread and we can put a locking screw. We are not very much successful in this because making this eye is not that technically and mechanically possible. We are trying to see that if we can get a locking and a nail, but there are some of the cases where we have got a very good result. So I'm just showing one of them. So at the end, I just thank you. And I just uh, summarize that titanium nail may allow post-fixation angulation. So please be very careful in older age group. In addition to IT and subtrochanteric fracture, modified endonailing can be used for femoral staff fractures. And in selected cases, endonailing is a good option. Please consider this. And endonail removal is easier than 10 nails, particularly in pediatric case where you have no eye to catch all the feet. So I thank you very much for this opportunity and uh, sharing my, I mean, allowing me to share my views. Thank you. Thank you, Jetwa, sir, for bringing out those advantages of Ender's nail, especially in the pediatric age group as well. Thank you so much. Any comments on uh, Jetwa, sir's presentation? Jetwa, sir, you are a master in this procedure. And I have listened to you a number of times Actually, there are some new things that uh, I can learn from your presentation. But I think this is one of the best method in the ornamentarium of uh, fracture fixation of the femoral shaft fractures. And uh, I think uh, this method should be popularized by you because you are uh, giving lectures. You are also uh, giving um, uh, this uh, practical tips also. But anyhow, this method... Uh, in your state, it has been taken very well, but all over India, it is yet to be popularized. So I request you uh, to make it yes. more popular so that uh, it becomes a minimal invasive, uh, a happy fixation in uh, majority of the fractures of the trochanter as well as the subtrochanter. Yes, sir. Yes. So with this, uh, we'll go ahead with the Dr. Chandak, sir, and then uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Navin Thakkar, bhai. <clears throat> Able to see my screen, sir? Share screen, sir. Yeah, I'm sharing the screen. Yes. You can see my screen, sir, now? Yes, yes, yes. Go ahead. So uh, this I'll be keeping it very short and I'll make it mostly interactive. My topic given was centralization and prevention of malrotation during femoral nailing. There are four key steps in rotational alignment. Pre-draping assessment of internal rotation of the uninjured leg is very important. Keep patella central in AP and lesser trochanter. Note the profile of lesser trochanter. Note at the cortical diameters at the fracture site. And we have to replicate the internal rotation of other side. And in the distal interlock, when we do, we have to look at the perfect distal interlock with true lateral of knee. Pay attention to four important things. Foot position, lesser trochanter, cortical weight, and the fibular overlap. Uh, of course, this starts with the fracture reduction itself, which is actually a prerequisite for rotation control. And fracture reduction in our day-to-day -day femoral nailing is a four step procedure, we also have to pay attention to all this. It was reported by these authors that malrotation is a very common after femoral nailing and the exact definition of a malrotated femur is controversial, but it is widely agreed that a rotational malalignment less than 10 degrees is considered normal with a compatible uh, normal function. 
while more than 30 degrees is a deformity which requires correction. Research-wise, determination can be done, but difficult in day-to-day -day practice, you can do it by a CT torsion measurement, but actually not carried out in day-to-day -day practice. The rotation control starts right from the prepping step. And if we are in theater at that moment itself, we can look at the patient position, patient's patella orientation and the lesser trochanter and the foot plate. Because once you come after the draping and once the patient is draped, then it becomes a bit difficult. However, your palpatory skills are still valid. Uh, in lateral position, the entry point is easier, but increased positional difficulty uh, and imaging difficulty is there may lead to certain more amount of valgus and external rotation in this position. The table and the rotation, both are to be correlated. If you are using an eccentric post, it is a bit different. If you are using a banana position, it is a bit different. And if you are using a thigh support to elevate the knee to get a better imaging for uh, locking distally, the position is a bit different. So reduction and alignment correlation also is to be done for taking into account the rotation of fractures. If you are using a clamp assisted reduction, that gives you a better ability to control rotation. Also in lateral plane, a good imaging has to be there so that exactly you can correlate which way the rotations are going on. If the rotation is difficult, I use this thread tip pusher so that I can rotate the fragment as well as I can push it and then properly align the fragment. During guide wire selection, centering, rimming, and final fixation, we always keep an eye and my right hand would always be on the patella operation so that I know that the limb has not moved in between. And uh, guide wire, not only medullary cannulation of guide wire, the position of guide wire is important, the fracture reduction is important, and the final guide wire, what position it takes is important, and we have certain tools to manage that. A correct distal rimming of the fragment which is well aligned and rotationally controlled is also important. So what I found out is a conventional rimmer can reach the femur up to this point. I use an extra long which is actually 580 mm custom made rimmer to drill up to the last point. And here uh, rather than a corded bend rimmer, the rimmer is usually corded bend. I would use a straight rimmer to go as distal to get a good interlock in a distally placed fracture. This is what I found interesting. When we pass a guide wire, usually it is gently C curve and there is a quad bend. So first hit happens onto the lateral cortex. At this point, so what I would do, I would just rotate. Here is the femur which touches. So I will rotate one fourth quarter outward. And then once it comes to this point, usually here it would be anteriorly placed and then one again quarter. So with two and a half turns, most of the times uh, we would be in the center of femur. However, you can adjust it seeing the C arm. Coming to rotation judgment. So this is what I have found interesting and I'm going uh, uh, to show what I have noted. This is imagine a left femur. So when you see this picture, so this is, this is rotated, externally, externally rotated femur and you see a external condensation. This is what you see is the internal condensation. This. So this is a normal femur configuration. Pay attention to the rotation of this is neutral. Here it is externally rotated. Here it is internally rotated. So this outer condensation in external rotation, the inner condensation is there in the internal rotation. And with this also I judge the rotations. This is very interesting to find and not reported in the literature. For segmental fracture, rotation judgment is difficult. So you have to manage both the reduction first and then only the rotational judgment would be fine. If you find the rotational uh, alignment of both the fragment is different, you can rotate, negotiate your guide wire and rim. And after rimming, you can adjust the alignment. The knee axis determination by corticoid does not usually give the rotational guidelines. However, it gives you the axis determination. Rotation control in revision surgery on a routine table is easy and can be compared with the normal table. However, this usually is not possible in an acute trauma situation. 
in a revision situation, usually you will find the limb quite externally rotated. So you can put a bump and then internally rotate that, equalize on the both the rotation. And if you are open reducing, the linear aspera usually gives you a good rotational judgment. Say friends, we are very happy in rounds when the rotations are fine. But to achieve this, actually we have to act at the time of surgery itself. So four key steps in rotational alignment, again to emphasize are mostly clinical judgments and radiographic CM judgments, and then we get the rotation right. Thank you so much uh, for this opportunity. I must thank Dr. Uh, for giving me opportunity and any questions if they are there. If not, then we can move on to the last lecture by Dr. Navin Thakkar. I, I just I just want to congratulate you. A superb, superb observation you made for the condensation of the online. And one more thing which I just want to point out is that please see that the fracture table foot piece is in the line with ankle. In your first slide, it is, it is in the line with ankle. In your second slide, the foot piece is in the middle. So when yeah. the foot is attached in the middle, when you rotate it, it also adds onto the translation. So you might get something wrong. So a good fracture table is very important. Mm -hmm. Can I say one thing? Yes, sir. Sir, you have shown that the bent guide wire, how to you are rotating. What we do is once we pass the reamer across the fracture, we remove that guide wire and put another straight guide wire that will not deviate from the center. Yes, a very good important tool. And therefore, on our trolley, we always keep two guide wires. One yes. is bent, at the tip, it is bent. And once uh, and once you reach to the distal fragment in the center with the reamer, we remove that wire which is going either anterior or posterior or lateral or medial. We change that wire and that, that is protected by the reamer so that will not deviate. Yes, absolutely right. A very good so, tip. So the, the crux of lecture is constant attention to... Uh, the yes. how to avoid the mal rotation and mal position of even guide wire, nail position, and everything. So, this it is a is. prime prime uh, criteria that you should think of uh, preventing the mal rotation, which is mostly hydrogenic. It is, it is just like it is just like driving on the highway mm -hmm. <laughs> straight. <laughs> so, thank you, Chandak sir. And now we will move to last lecture of uh, Dr. Navin Bhai on uh, dynamization, uh, what is the evidence? Thank you, sir. Thank you very much for your uh, kind invitation. And now we, we are going that there is a practical dilemma of, of the surgeon. He has done a femur interlock nailing. Fracture is not uniting. What is the role of dynamization and case-based and what is the evidence in the literature? We'll be learning together. 90% gets united, Safima. There is no problem. Only less than 10% has a non union. And that typically is of supraesthemal and infraesthemal problem due to stability. You can see here, is it failing? Why? Because there is a isthmal combination, which we have already talked of of junctional fracture. It's a supraesthemal fracture. Again, you require a good stability in this type of fracture. Again, infraesthemal. You know that you need a good stability. You have to add something in the stability. Only nailing will not work in this situation. You can do primarily even a short plate will take care of two screws on either side. So main problem is the stability, bone to bone contact and the alignment and the biology that is vascularity, osteogenesis and the envelope and the soft tissue. The stability is under our hand, alignment and adequate fixation. Biology, you have to fill the gap to induce the osteogenesis, respect the envelope and the adjuvant therapy if it is required, that we know. But we are discussing today only dynamization. Does it help or does it harm? Let us see case by case. And what is the method of dynamization? What should be the timing of dynamization? What should be the type of fracture where dynamization will fail or succeed? So this is the case. 12 weeks. What will you do? Sir, can I ask the question to Dr. Jawar Jetwa? Because yes, I can see him only. Uh, on the... uh, it seems that on the medial side, there is a good contact. On the lateral side, it is less. So 12 weeks is a little bit, you know, in a mid borderline. Uh, we may wait for another one month. I mean, this is around uh, 
how many three months any the dynamization has to be done or not dr no, chandak no. sir chandak sir yeah dynamization will help here or not so, so basically has patient has any pain or difficulty no no it is it is a slight pain slight okay. limp and the x ray is showing it is not uniting and patient is moving one surgeon to other surgeon with the fracture line uh, sir ye jod nahi raha hai what to do so what i would still hold on because i can see good cortical continuity slide of the fracture so i'll just keep on holding without dynamization at this point okay gaade ko re sir फ्रैक्चरिंगल Uh, actually yes. there is a ratio ratio of the callus uh, after yes. dynamization yes. and the fracture yeah in the callus so you... dynamization uh, there is a some uh, ratio is there so there is very the callus formation very little callus formation probably it may not heal yes. so you you say that the prob probably the decision was wrong dr gore is speaking who is yeah. speaking yeah dr gore i think i yeah, at 18 Weeks. If this is the picture, I'll do exchange nailing. You do the exchange nailing. So the previous decision, we are focusing on dynamization, sir. That was not the wrong. The decision was taken was wrong. No, no, no. decision was not no. wrong. Sometimes it helps. Sometimes it may not help. So that, that is why no. we are, we. What is to be done? The audience <laughs> is asking. The young orthopedic surgeons are asking. So this is the dilemma of. Every orthopedic surgeon, either senior or a junior orthopedic surgeon. No, no. Post operative, post operatively, we have to see that has dynamization occurred, but it has stayed the same as it was before screw. No, this is here. This is so here. Here, here it has dynamization not occurred because it is snugly fit in the proximal part, so it, it will not allow fit. sliding of the screw. It is. The, it is not allowing. Okay. Uh, not allowing. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yes. So these are the findings of the all the experts, right? and you can see what happened at 24 weeks it is failing so it has become a more unstable construct by doing yes. dynamization so many, so many times dynamization does not help is harms that yeah. is the message yeah. so what was what what was wrong here what was wrong what was wrong with the dynamization technique <laughs> Can can anybody say the principle of dynamization and what was wrong in this case? What was wrong here? Actually, we have to see the excursion of the nail after dynamization here. Suppose if there is a, is there any migration of the nail with the previous X-ray? Any any other finding? Any other finding by the expert? So. Lower down, if you can see, there is some amount of uh, uh, rotation of the nail which is seen. Yes, and that is there. That is that is there from the previous one. Yeah. So, so I think in that situation, the nail is not at all stable. We have to remove the nail and do a, a proper fixation. Either. That is right. That is right. But we are we are just focusing on dynamization just now. The principle is. dynamization should not be done at the cost of the rotational stability dynamization not to be done at the cost of rotational stability you cannot remove the all the screws from one side that is the principle right this is the another example 12 weeks both the screws are there here and this is the position at 12 weeks what will you do This is not going to unite by your dynamization, removing a single screw. Also, it's because there is no nothing 
there is no process of union at all. Dynamization to work in a stable implant, you must have a process of uh, some uh, bone formation. Okay. So that is the opinion of Dr. Gadegone, the expert uh, of Naili. Uh, any other opinion from anybody? Chandak, sir. What do you feel? What will happen? What will be the fate of this patient? Fate of this case? This is your case. Imagine that this is your case. At the 12 weeks, he is presenting to you and says that I have a, some limp and some pain and it is 12 weeks. What, what will you suggest? So I would not suggest him dynamization. If at all, I want to revise this. I would go ahead with <clears throat> uh, augmentation plate and addition of grafts in the uh, defect. That would be my final solution to him. That, because that is that is right. But one surgeon has advised him the dynamization. I, I would not advise him dynamization. Okay. Let us see what is happening. Now we have discussed it. So it is a very confusing situation as far as dynamization is concerned. So we must keep, keep, keep our... Uh, Ideas clear cut, concept clear cut with the evidences. Now let us see what is happening. Surgeon removed one screw. This is 18 weeks. What do you feel? This screw has been removed. The upper dynamic hole is kept. The static hole has been removed at the 18 weeks. What do you feel now? This was at 12 weeks. This is at 18 weeks. This is going for hypertrophic non-union. This is going for hypertrophic non-union. Anybody has any opinion? So as it looks, we can see some amount of trabecular crossing here. So I'm not right. sure with this X-ray. I would like other two views to opine on this. Right. Case. You, are, you are right. You are right. Absolutely. We need more planes of X-ray, uh, epilateral, oblique, right oblique, left oblique to see the circumference of the callus. You are right. But what will happen? What do you think? What will be the fate after dynamization? It will fail, it will harm, or it will use useful. Any taker? Dr. Jawar Bhai? How, how, how is the patient's feeling? Is the patient feeling that more pain or he is feeling that yes, no, no, he, things he, are he, happening? He, he, after dynamization, he is feeling better, little better, better little uh, better, little so, better. So, so one thing is very clear that dynamization means excursion of the nail. So most of the time when you remove one screw, let there be dimension and put that screw back so that the rotational stability is not... Okay, so uh, you are advising oh that now after six weeks, we have to uh, again give the rotational stability by inserting the second screw which has been removed. Yes, after, yes, yes, after dynamization is done. Okay. Yes. okay. Any, any other opinion? We are making interactive uh, so that we can learn out of this. So see, see the thing is what is happening. Uh, we have to understand the nature. Screw retained at 24 weeks, it is healed. <laughs> so the principle is you should not remove all screw from one side. That is the principle of dynamization. Dynamization has not to be done on the compromise of rotational stability. When you are having a little bit combinated fracture or an oblique fracture, if it is a transverse fracture, yes, that we will come to know about the type of fracture. But is the one principle is at least one screw has to be retained on either of the segment. And where you want a dynamization, it should be in the dynamic hole and static has to be removed. This is the common principle. Another case, 20 weeks, this is the condition. What will you do, sir? 28 weeks. 28 weeks, proximal femur. This patient had a five to six fracture, ulna, radius, shoulder, multiple fractures in a polyclinic setup. This is a fracture. This dynamization is not going to help. It will make a more unstable fracture. It needs a bone augmentation by plate and bone graft. Yes, yes, you are right, sir. You are right. Perfectly right. You have said that okay. at the cost of the stability, you cannot do dynamization. That is the principle. So, so here, although... the here the surgeon has the dynamization by removing both the screws from the distal. And it was a supraestimable fracture. And it is going for the non-union. We revised it with the nail and the plate. Now another case, 16 weeks, distal fracture. This is the position uh, of fixation. And now the surgeon has removed 
both the screws from the proximal part and screw started breaking nail also started breaking so it is creating a instability many times so rotational stability is the priority rather than the dynamization how much dynamization is possible 15 mm is the total so we can do this much of dynamization not more than n we have to minus the screw diameter so 6 to 8 mm is the gap where we can do 6 to 8 mm dynamization not more than that so the principle this is the paper this is the evidence evaluation of method and timing in nail dimension for treating delayed healing femoral soft fracture retained screws are better than all screws removed more than 24 weeks it is not effective that is what the finding has been uh, done by many papers another thing more than 50 percent becomes unstable and fail significant sorting happens when there is a combination so more than 50 percent fails on dynamization intramedial nailing femoral soft fracture transverse or short fracture isthmal fracture type 1 or type 2 combination there you can do dynamization easily without any problem much problem but this is the benchmark study where they have not done a single dynamization static fixation we use even in inherently stable type 1 and 2 fracture based on authors previous investigations showing the loss of fixation in 10 percent of those receiving dynamic i am nailing Healing occurred in 98% of the fractures treated with the st static lock fixation. Average time to union was 19 weeks. What author has summarized? Stating locking of intramedial nails in a femoral soft fracture does not appreciably inhibit the fracture healing. Routine conversion to dynamic fixation, although occasionally necessary, need not to be performed. If you do not do dynamization, there is not going to be any harm. But if you do a dynamization in certain condition, except these conditions, transverse or short oblique, isthmal type 1 or type 2 combination, and the condition that not more than 24 weeks, then it may be effective. So this is the principle or the evidence with the dynamization. Another case, this is the 24 weeks. What do you think? Twenty-four weeks. Again, 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 it's 24 weeks. It will make it unstable. It will make unstable, right? Absolutely. So, right. Although, although we are discussing dynamization, but my observation is that there are many cases which I have seen that there is no activity at all. Most probably, they are smoking. Yes, you are right. But here, it was not smoking. It was a young girl, and this case came to us when it came to us, and what we have done that I am showing that stability part has to be taken care of 28 weeks this is the situation and patient is doing window shopping every four weeks x-rays are getting done 32 weeks now what to do the operating surgeon is trying to see every four weeks x-ray and this is the every four week x-ray you can see from the 24 28 32 now it has come to you as a second surgeon. What will you do? This needs uh, this needs augmentation by bone grafting or exchange nailing. So dynamization will not help. As no, you see. no, no dynamization will help. I think now so here here the problem. Huh, yes, yes, uh, sir. I I think this would proceed to auto dynamization and then healing. So auto dynamization is a possibility of breaking the screws by the nature. You said. Yeah, because as, I think as, as, I think there is a good I think there is a good alignment here, good contact here. Yes, so, so almost good contact. This may heal. This may heal, but it is taking longer time. Yes. So we are worried. Patient is worried. Surgeon is worried. Patient is moving one to other place. So we just injected the bone marrow. We thought that the we have good stability, but we need some biology to be given. And you can see it has healed at 36 weeks, started healing. And 40 weeks, it healed. <laughs> so but it is very difficult to say, Naveen Bhai, it is because of bone marrow. Yes, you are right. You are absolutely right. So dynamization, if done wrongly, it would have 
surely failed we do not know that that injection has helped but surely keeping the stability according to that paper wait it may take time but have a static locking don't go for dynamization in a slighted combination this combination navin by my one observation here all nails are they are procentric entry point with medialization in the distal femur right is there any different nail they are available or it's something like because all they are procentric entry point they are all centromedullary oh. nail but yes. uh, you are you are right you are right if the nail entry and alignment is little bit like that then there won't be a collapse of the fracture in the shaft yes that is preventing not in the alignment the medullary canal so that is slightly preventing there is obliquely locked fracture at the fracture and that gap takes longer time to heal so in this condition you have to wait wait and wait while you are waiting patient is very much worried so you can add the bone marrow graft and what are the condition where you get a success defect is less than 5 mm it must be a stable construct this is the prerequisite no signs of infection as dr jawad jetwa said good number of progenitor cells no smoking and the smokers this will not help so these are the prerequisites before doing in such cases when there is a dilemma of to do a dynamization or not to do dynamization so now another case these are the slides from dr tanna sir day 1 before dynamization 3 months post op dynamization 7 months so dynamization helps and you can see here the sir has shown beautifully at one year again a case where there is a bone plug here you can see here if there is a bone plug the dynamization will be difficult it will not help much there should not be a clear space below or up you can see the nail is progress up another case where there is a bone block here so there is no place of nail to migrate to accommodate the collapse if fracture impacts after dynamization same here in tibia if you have done a this subchondral fixation in the femur or tibia then also there is a problem fracture wants to heal as dr chandak sir has said auto dynamization screws will break if it is not dynamized it will break and it will get healed so nature wants to heal and it gets healed gradually 3 months after the screw breakage you can see it is healed combinated fracture do not dynamize but if not healing graft it it is better to have augment or graft it no do not make the unstable it further here you can see the it a surgeon has made the unstable the nail has migrated on one side it is removed so again at the cost of rotational stability do not dynamize if you feel that with the one screw dynamic screw i can have a good rotational stability then you can dynamize or you can do this grafting like this dynamization is not must for the healing fracture health heals up without the dynamization that the paper has said but there should not be any obstruction in dynamization like here screw or like this dr vivek trikha so as the case of the neck femur and the shaft where the nail was abutting at the dhs screw and there was no collapse of the distal fracture the similar case there should not be any obstruction for migration of the nail other this otherwise this gap will not close so you have to remove this obstruction and then and then it will heal another thing is the bone plug here it even of dynamize it will not work and the bone plug here you can see here when you are doing intermittent nailing in uh, you may get the bone plug inside it and then it will not heal or you have a callus here bone extra bone then then also dynamization will not work nail has to have a space to migrate up or down after dynamization at the time of index operation keep nail sort of subchondral bone in the mid shaft so little sort nail is better little sort but dynamize before bone plug forms at the end of the nail so always see before dynamization there is there a space above or below accordingly where you are dynamization you must check for the space there should be enough space another trick dr tanna sir has expressed is a transverse fracture at isthmus rim more 1 to 1.5 mm larger adequate size nail not 
canal stuffing, pushed by hand and not hammered except at the end. In dynamic mode, screw at one end in overhaul away from the fracture, but still it has to be rotational stability by at least one screw and the full weight bearing on day one. Forget about the fracture will heal. So rim 430 nail and have a nail of 410, little shorter than what your rim. Transverse fracture with bone, good bone-to-bone -bone reduction, there is no need to do static locking, only do dynamic locking. That is also allowed in the tibia and the femur. But even if you do not dynamize, it will heal. Same fracture converted to dynamic nail holes. Then it is retained on the one side, one screw. So the principle is you have to retain. So the conclusion is dynamization is not a must for healing. If need, dynamization should be done early by six weeks when you see the callus. And you take the precaution that there is enough space and the rotational stability is not hampered. Nail must have a space to travel for dynamization. It's the first fracture where you feel that there is a good stability, as I have shown in that case of the bone marrow. It was a isthmus fracture. Dynamization can be done, but it is better to have a stability than dynamization. A small request to all. Now in today's EC, we have made that other is mandatory for update. So update with the other, all the members. And thank you very much, sir. So Navin Bhai, excellent presentation. And uh, I think uh, Jedva, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, okay. Actually, you can comment on the today's webinar. Uh, uh, how it is? Uh, it was. It was. It was very important and very clear cut messages have been sent that in all aspect of a femoral nailing, as we are discussing our intricacy, that you have to be very careful to get the best of the reduction, best of the implant, and also good observation intraoperatively and also in follow up that what is happening. So, in my view, many of the important points have been. Uh, emphasize and many of the new tricks, many of the new practical tips which has come out and this should be a very good reference for all those people who wants to find out that there could be minimum of the failure after femoral fractures. So many good tips are there. I'm really happy uh, to know all this and also to be part of this webinar. Do not, do, not, do, not, do not take the soft femur fracture lightly. <laughs> Sandak sir, please conclude. Thank you all the faculty members for uh, giving your valuable time and preparing so well uh, for this important webinar. That was a wonderful meeting. I think we have all enjoyed and had a lot of take-home messages. Thank you, Dr. Gadegune sir, Dr. Trikha for constituting the uh, NAILS subcommittee. Uh, opportunity to uh, have a good introductory um, uh, webinar on nailing and now what he has intricacies of don't put fabric and mission for 14 eight challenge you know the light about eight captain come for good night thank you thank you very much so thank much. you this will close this webinar and thank you ortho tv for giving us this wonderful platform of patient and and our own education uh, on this one. Ortho TV and IOTV both, sir. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's, a, it's a good symbiosis between the IOTV and Ortho TV. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Navin Bhai, for uh, giving that opportunity. Thank you so yeah. much. Thank you, sir. Marshi, if you are there, we can just close down the recording and uh, transmission. नतीज कौन करेता हाथ ती व्यक्ति उत्तर देता है